Hey, everybody. Welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm week by week, arc by arc. My name is Matt Freeman, your host and overstuffed chair sitting and bitter tea drinking maniacal supervillain. And I'm joined, as always, by superhero in a can drinking newbie, Scott Daly. Scott, control your weird containment foam based powers and tell me how you're doing. <laughs> I'm doing wonderful, Matt. I'm doing so good. And uh, yes, as you rudely rudely hinted uh this is the podcast where you a card carrying worm expert guide me a first time reader through the merchant controlled territory as i inspect interpret and yes even speculate on what the story is and where it is going this week matt we're covering the first half of arc 11 infestation that would be chapters one through eight this is the first time we've had to break up an arc because uh, it's really long um so we are not doing any of the interlude portion we will do that next week we're just doing chapters one through eight um yeah. and yeah you know, There's plenty to talk about this week. Oh God. Uh, yeah, this is going to be an absolutely stuffed episode, so I'm not going to waste any time. Um, but before I do that, let me waste some time by telling you cool. uh, how much I loved these chapters. Um, I think we were coming off of Arc 10, which I don't think was either of our favorites. We had some um, fairly critical things to say about it. And then we hit this arc kind of like running and I was engaged the entire time. I, I loved where the story went. Um, I loved the, the arc like just seemed to have a very solid like overarching theme to it um, it was very clear what it was trying to do and where it was trying to take the story um and it was wonderful yeah this arc has a lot of great moments in it and i didn't remember this as being one of my favorite parts of the story from my first read through so it was actually kind of a pleasant surprise to get to this point and it wasn't actually one of the arcs i was looking forward to in advance but not, but since we got to it i i was pleasantly surprised to recall how great it is yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is Taylor truly stepping in to the supervillain uh, role that she's been kind of playing in for for a few arcs at least. Yeah, we see some some major character development along that axis, and yeah, there's, there's there's really a lot of stuff going on here, and, yeah. and we're gonna have to just get into the into the nitty gritty of it to really go into it. I think. Yeah, let's let's just do it. Let's just do it. All right. But first. Uh, but first. <laughs> Without further ado, but first, uh, comments and questions from the Reddit this week. Uh, again, we're going to go pretty quick here, but um, as usual, Wildbo stopped by and, and gave some some of his thoughts on Arc 10. Um, he uh, he said, the one thing that stood out was that he said that his head wasn't really in the game for Arc 10, which, uh, first of all, I think it's incredible that Worm was written as a web serial. I think if Worm were like a book, it would... St- it would still be, you know, on my like bookshelf of favorite books. So when there's like an arc that falters a couple times, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm not really holding that against you, Wildbo. Um, I, I, I get, <laughs> I get it. Um, and, and in addition to that, this this arc contained the the Alec interlude, which which right, is incredible. That, yeah. So it's like yeah, I'm really, <laughs> I, I really don't want to come down too hard on arc ten. It, it, it was. Yeah, anyway. What do yeah, you to, to, say, to say that his head wasn't in the game in the same arc that the beautiful, not just from a story perspective, but from a writing perspective, Alec interlude was in is like crazy to me. Because like, I mean, yes, there are parts of the, the arc that I didn't like. Um, I think it's less of a, a focused work. Um, but that that interlude is wonderful i mean just just the writing skill on on display in getting into this character's point of view and doing all these things is is phenomenal and i mean to do that when your head's not fully in the game is just i can't even imagine yeah all right we're we're gonna leave arc 10 behind us and and uh <laughs> kind and, of and move on to, to greener pastures um so so scott um i mean my, my favorite moment of last arc by the way <laughs> was um when imp uses that flaming axe against uh the other uh the the wards okay so let's just let's just let's just turn into this head on because (laughs) yes i know what a fire axe is okay i i have no idea why when i was reading this thing that's what popped i worm just gets you in a headspace where you are just willing to accept anything so when you hear stuff so when you hear the words fire and axe you just put those together right. to hear and, a flaming and if, axe. And if you don't know if you don't know what Imp's power is, then 
it's completely possible that it could be a fire axe. Now, you might be saying, Scott, <laughs> Matt, Matt, why didn't you correct me in that yeah, moment? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So that we could maybe edit that out or something. And my answer to you is, I'm not a very good friend. All right, now let's move forward. Let's wow. move on. Wow. Okay, yeah. I do appreciate being called out by literally every single person on the planet Earth for that. Thank you, guys. I appreciate yeah. that. All right. Um, so there, there was actually a lot of general discussion about Dragon. Um, so I'm going to let you lead on this, if that's all right with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was, I guess there was a lot of pushback on my opinion of Dragon. Um, I got the, the phrase power hungry, I think specifically uh, sparked several uh, pieces of pushback from people. And, you know, I talked about this a lot in the Reddit thread. I don't want to take too much time here rehashing it, but um, I think, and, and again, I don't want to put thoughts into people's heads or anything, but I, I really feel like a lot of people's um, thoughts on this character are being influenced by things that I have not been shown yet. Um, obviously, this is an important character of the story. It's a character that we're going to be deal with again and again. But I think if you look at the interlude and all just the little nuggets of information we've gotten on Dragon beforehand, I think that I, I was not wrong in my interpretation that the, some of this stuff seems kind of shady. I mean, it, it is very true that Dragon seems altruistic in her needs, but it is also like she's showing a real sense of annoyance and frustration towards limitations. And and a lot of people have said she just wants to be free, and I think that's true, but that that's not really the focus of it, at least in this interlude. She's not, like, talking about freedom for the sake of freedom. She's, like, freedom from control so she can uh, do all the things she wants to do. And, like, look, that's, like, if, if she's really going to be a good character, and I think, based on, honestly, based on a lot of people's responses to my opinions, it, it seems like she is going to be a, a character, a force for good in this story. Um, that's great, but I don't think there's anything in the arc that makes it so we can just take her at face value, especially with a lot of the weird thing that's going, like, like the, the, the fetus thing is really weird and uncomfortable. It's not a very... Uh, nice image to go along with a quote unquote nice person. So I, I think I was I was valid in my interpretation. I'm not saying that other interpretations were wrong, um, and maybe I shouldn't have used the phrase power hungry. But I think she definitely does want more power. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I distinctly remember that that was my impression at this point in the story too. That that she was being set up as a as like an antagonist to Taylor, and you know she was hitting all of those dangerous AI tropes. So. Um, I think that's a, I, I agree. That's a valid interpretation. I will I will speak no word of what is to come. But um, I yeah, I, I I think I think that may have been what was intended. Even so, yeah. So I mean, I, I look forward to seeing where Dragon goes. I definitely was not saying like I you know I think speaking generally, a lot of this is me having to come to a lot of kind of firm declarations on things when we haven't gotten the full evidence yet. And I have to do that because I'm talking on a podcast for two hours a week. So I have to come down on a side of something even when I'm not quite ready to, but if I didn't do that, it would just be me saying, I don't know for, <laughs> for a while. So I, yeah. I have to come down on things when I'm maybe not as comfortable coming down on it as, as I would like to be. So I'm never like fully declaring stuff and I'm never going to say that I can't walk back my opinion and say I was wrong. Um, but I think it was in the text and that's, all, that's all I'll say. Yeah. I mean, just from my point of view, as the person who's leading you, I'm, I'm just as interested in when you're wrong as when you're right, because when you're wrong, you're, you're showing, you're showing where the writing was leading you, even if the place where you think it was leading you is not the place where it's actually leading you. And that's, that's information about the story still. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fair. Yeah. Um, so one, one discussion, which I think was, was really interesting and, and I don't even know if we have time to fully explore it. In fact, I'm sure we don't, um, <laughs> Nihil Supernum, which it's appropriate that this user brings it up because that's a Harry Potter and the methods of rationality reference. Um, and that story is very much about this type of topic, uh, was, was mentioning the idea of, of Alec and whether or not he should be blamed held responsible for, judged for uh, who he is and his actions based on his history. And there was a lot of discussion about this topic. Yeah, uh, I, I found this really fascinating. Um, 
And I, I think my perspective on this is it depends on what you're using the word blame to mean, right? Um, so if if we look at it from you like from a societal perspective, we have to assign blame to someone because blame assignment equals punishment, right? So right. we have to we have to say who's responsible for this because we need to punish the person responsible. Well, in that if in that perspective, then Alec is to blame because Alec needs to be punished for the safety of the people around him. Um, I, I said last week that he should probably get help somewhere. He should probably not be able to walk the streets. Like I said, I, I did not, I did not think like throwing this kid in the birdcage and throwing away the key is the right move. But from that perspective, he should be to blame. But that of course is not like the sole blame. Like there obviously some blame rests in a bunch of other factors, some of which I'm not even fully clear on yet um, related to what his, what powers like this actually do to a person. But um, I don't know. What, what is your, your, your look on this? Yeah, I, I, it, mine is more of a big cloud of, of questions than any firm like position on, you know, what, what should be done with Alec. Like, yeah, I mean, for, for the way our society is, is structured now, just like you said, you have to be able to assign blame. And we have this concept of, of justice, of criminal justice and so forth, where we hold people responsible for, for what they did. And we, we essentially, essentially, we have a punitive criminal justice system instead of instead of a rehabilitative one. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that's, that, that filters into our mindset in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in exploring the, the wide spectrum of this stuff. Like I, I always remember in this context, uh, this, this idea from, from Peter Watts, um, who is the author of blind sight, which is another of my favorite books, um, who, who has this idea that in the future, like personal responsibility will, will not be, not be a concept people respect anymore because, People will understand that free will is an illusion. And so if you don't have free will, you can't be responsible for your actions. So if someone does something terrible, then everyone just says, oh, it's, you know, this is obviously a terrible thing that's happened. Let's try to fix this person so that this doesn't happen anymore. And and, and the idea of, of like socially right. apportioned blame is, is non-existent. I think that's interesting. I think that's sort of one of those uh, uh, appealing to the non-existent better nature of humans things where I don't <laughs> yeah. think that will actually happen. Um, but it's, it's an interesting lens, I think. Um, and yeah, yeah. I, I just, I don't know what, I don't know what the right answer is. I don't think philosophy professors know what the right answer is necessarily. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, what's so fun about this is I think 20 people could look at the same scenario and come up with a, a different quote unquote solution to how blame works and, and who to assign blame to and not. Um, I, I, I'm kind of a practical person, so I looked at it at that very from that very practical spectrum. But that's not to say that anyone else is is wrong. Um, to say that Alex should not be blamed for the things that that he has become. Um, and I don't know. I I really enjoyed this conversation. I like that it happened. Um, I think that's one of the things I like a lot about this story is it can bring these conversations to the forefront. And I, that's what I like about doing this podcast because we get to talk about them, um, and it's really fun. So I appreciate yeah. this comment. Um, this was this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. And, and on top of that, uh, special shout out to King Bob who wrote a fantastic post about Alec. Uh, we don't have time to go into it, but if you're not hanging out on the Reddit thread, go check out that comment. Yeah. I love that comment. Um, that it, it basically distilled down like every aspect of Alec and, and into, into a very easily readable and, and digestible format. Um, in a way that frankly was better than, than everything that I said on the podcast about him. So, um, go check that out if you haven't already for sure. Yeah. All right, Scott, are we ready to move into the beat by beat discussion? Oh, I think we are. Let's do it. This is Alrighty. somehow half an arc going to be absolutely stuffed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it will be. All right. So we, we, we cold open Scott on Taylor in Coyle's base, bleeding and injured. Kate bodies are strewn about. She heads for Dinah, but Coyle is already there. And Dinah is dead. Dun, dun, dun. Taylor feels Coyle use his power, countering her every attack, and then blows zombie dust into her face, and she finds herself suddenly compliant. Pet, he intoned, and fresh terror shook me to my core. And then Coyle takes his mask off, and we see that it is her father. So, uh, this is an interesting way to open an arc. <laughs> yeah, it was very unexpected. New. There was there was honestly a fraction of a second there when I went like, no. 
And I actually yeah. believed it. Uh, it, even though it's kind of constructed that it's very obvious it's a dream. I think the minute you see Coil divide realities and she's conscious of it, um, it is kind of a pretty big hint that I, 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 we've seen no other indication that anyone else but Coil is aware of his multiple dimensions or whatever. So it's kind of a big hint that this is not uh, actually happening. But yeah, but man, it, it for that half a second, it really gripped me. Yeah, no, I, I don't remember how this affected me the first time through, but uh, I, I have no problem with this. So she wakes up from this dream um, and we see that she's been having bad dreams lately, drawing together the horror of everything she's been through lately, everything she's been responsible for. The dream makes her feel compelled to move forward because it, it's emotionally emphasized that Dinah is, in a sense, on a deadline because she may die or she may be broken in some other way before Taylor can free her. Yeah, and I think this kind of touches back to what we were talking about last week, where Taylor's kind of putting up saving Dinah as the thing that's going to make everything worth it. Um, and, and she's obviously having these repeated nightmares because her subconscious is attempting to deal with all the other shit that her conscious mind is completely ignoring. Um, she's guilty. She's guilty about Coil and Dinah. She's guilty about her father. She's guilty about all these people that she's put in harm's way. I love the image of all these dead capes. Um, it, it's rather left ambiguous in her dream whether she killed them or whether they were just killed when she got there. Um, and I love that ambiguity to it. Um, and then her greatest fear of all was like losing control. Um, and, and that maybe that she's just been used by coil the whole time. And that's kind of all encapsulated in this little short dream sequence. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about dream sequences for a second here in general, because I normally hate them. <laughs> um, I think a lot of times, especially like in film and TV, they're kind of a cheating way to reveal information to a character, like prophecy information or exposition or way for a character to learn information. Um, like, it's just a shortcut in writing where if you need a character to know this fact, but you have no way of teaching that fact to them in an organic, real way, you just have a dream, and then they learn it in a dream. So yeah. th that that really bugs me. But I like it here. Um, and I like it here because it's not doing any of those things listed above. Like, Coyle is, is not Taylor's father. We're not being given information uh, key to the character's, like, uh, actual arc. Um, th the whole thing is just a way of showing Taylor's emotional state and show it in a way that the Taylor's narration never could because she's just not like aware of the stuff. She, she compartmentalizes it away. Um, and I think that the cool thing about this is the rest of this chapter, we're going to see a pretty confident Taylor, right? Like in, in a few minutes, she's going to look in the mirror and stop seeing her normal flaws or at least see less of them. Um, she's, she's in a really good place, but w we have in the back of our mind, this emotional turmoil, from this dream that she had. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels like a very realistic dream. It's, it's, it's described realistically as it's happening. And I especially love the aspect that she wakes up from the dream with this sense of like, like com compulsion to just get on the Dinah situation as fast as she can, because right. is it, there's a deadline. And I, I've felt that often where like I wake up from a dream or a nightmare and and there's a strong sense lingering long after the memory of the dream has faded that I need to I need to get on that, whatever it is. It's, it's yeah. probably something abstract. And, and you know, but but it, it, that really makes sense to me. And uh, and it, as you said, off the bat, it, it shows us her emotional state more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So she gets out of bed. She puts on her contacts, which she's wearing now. It's the first indication of a change in appearance. So uh, <laughs> unsurprisingly, Matt, <laughs> I really like this. Um, yeah. like there's, there's, there's that very obvious surface level, uh, using a physical change to denote a character change beat that stories use all the time. Um, but that's not good enough for wild bow, um, because it's not just a physical change to denote a character change. It's actually a beat in the story that we're hinted at and then kind of pays off later that there's in, there's an in reason world for this physical change. So, um, it's marrying the story element to a character arc it's it's really functional like it, it's it's efficient and functional and well done yeah that's right wild Bo never only does one thing he's always yeah. doing two things. exactly yeah so then she walks that out through her lair and we get a description of this this place that coil has set up for her it's three stories tall it's an it's a narrow dark building decked with heavy metal shutters the topmost floor is taylor's living space the second floor is skitter's and it is terrifying. 
the walls of the second floor are lined with terrariums full of spiders covered in mirrors and lit with fluorescence. Yeah, I love this detail, how scary it is. Like, I looked at it, I think she said she saw it in a picture or a video once, and was like, I just wanted to recreate that, but more. Uh, it's really yeah. fun. Um, but I do really like that Taylor, at least, seems to be really pushing this Taylor and Skitter separation, like they're physically separated by these two floors. Um, and this is really interesting, considering kind of the rest of the arc is about those two distinct personalities like blurring just into one to where the difference is just gone by the end of this arc or at least this half of the arc um, I, I can't say just this arc this time this is gonna get <laughs> it's gonna get tough but i yeah. think i think that's something we can track throughout the arc is how these personalities are blurring into just one person um and, and so we set it up distinctively with this uh visualization of them having distinct floors and then we go from there yeah, I think the the biggest uh, exhibition of that is how she treats her secret identity in this arc. But we'll we'll get to those moments in in a short while. Yeah, and, and to to go along with that, I wanted to point out that there's a, a little three beat within this arc uh, regarding Taylor's referencing herself as a villain. Um, mm. It starts in this chapter where she says, "I walked through my new base of operations wearing an oversized T-shirt and a pair of underwear, not exactly fitting attire for a supervillain." Um, she's going to call herself a villain twice more before the end of this arc. And I think that's just a fun, like three beats are fun little narrative tricks that like wild Bo might not have even <laughs> consciously done that, but they're everywhere. Like the rule of three is everywhere in story. So um, we see this, this kind of hammering home, this theme of her embracing her, her villainy in this arc. That's right. Yeah. Th this first one is just priming her to, to be ready, uh, priming us rather as the readers to be ready <laughs> to, to pay attention to this. And, and then we'll, we'll see it again. And then we'll see, it recontextualized. Yep. Yeah. So um, she even has a stereotypical giant villain chair and a creepy <laughs> abstract painting in her in her skitter area. I love this so much. It's yeah. so Bond. <laughs> I know. So that the ground floor uh, just has bunk beds and a kitchen. And she doesn't really describe what it's for, just that it seems to be another living area with some spare capacity to it. Uh, the whole layer has power and, and water and, you know, basic living utilities, which nobody else in the city really, really has yet. Um, so Taylor is awake at, you know, early in the morning because of her nightmare. So she decides to passive aggressively call Coil at 545 in the morning, um, waking up whichever version of him is in this reality and <laughs> asks for eight henchmen to be sent over to help with something. Yeah, this was a little fun beat. At, like she's trying to make herself feel better by being like, "I'm gonna wake him up, and I don't even right. care if he was sleeping." Okay, that makes it all okay. Good job. Yeah, right. Yeah, all better now. Uh, so she prepares to go for a run. She changes and she examines herself in the mirror, and she finds that she looks different. She's grown some. Her diet and exercise patterns have changed. She's more tan. She's wearing contacts now, and she has scars that she didn't have before. But she's also carrying a lot more guilt. Matt, did, did Taylor just description fuck herself? <laughs> did that happen? I think so. I mean, I mean, I, I, That's I a think first. she did. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely love this. Um, and this goes along with the, the, the setup with the contacts change. Um, Taylor is kind of embracing her villainy in this chapter, as, as we've already said. Um, and, and then... It, we're, we're kind of seeing how comfortable she now is in this role. And we're seeing that through her, uh, who her comfort in her body now. And these things that, uh, would have bothered her before don't seem to bother her anymore. She's confident. She's sure of herself. And that's a really great way to show it. Yeah. I love it. So she heads out, she runs along the beach through an eerie desolate wasteland she sees some merchants' tags, and she thinks about how that gang has expanded uh, after the disaster and how she'll need to deal with them shortly. There's some uh, construction or, or, I guess, repair efforts ahead, which she doesn't really pay attention to until she's upon them, at which point her dad sees her and calls out her name. Uh, so she stops. You know, the, that nightmare is fresh in her mind, of course. And they talk with him kind of restraining himself, holding back not being too emotional, that they're very much at arm's length. Um, he's trying not to come on too strongly, but he's offering that she can come home anytime she likes. She lies and tells him that she's staying outside the city limits so that he'll feel better. And then she lies that she's only in the city to check on the house. And then she basically lies by saying that she's maybe open to having lunch with him because she 
probably isn't at all, actually. And she feels bad about this, but just kind of observes it as the status quo now. Um, and then before she leaves, she mentions, uh, because she sees he's wearing glasses, she mentions that the Slaughterhouse Nine are in town, and he takes off his glasses. Yeah, so, Matt, this was hard for me to read. Um, I, I was, like, pretty upset last time uh, Danny and, and Taylor were in the same room together, uh, thinking that their relationship was broken. But, you know, there was this small kernel of myself that was, like, hoping that there was a, a time in the future where they could come back together. Uh, with this, I just, that's that's gone, as far as I'm concerned. Because their interaction is so guarded. They're, like... They're, they're, it doesn't seem like they're actually having a conversation. They're just like too busy thinking of what's the next thing I can say that won't upset that the other person too much. So they're not yeah. actually like uh, like interacting on any kind of real level. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know if the scene ever actually says this, but I'm really imagining this conversation like taking place like with them like six feet apart and they're not even close to each other. Like like yeah. if I was filming this, I'd put them each on the edge of the frame and have all this. Uh, white space in between them as if like there's just a void between them that is like uncrossable um and I, I do i think this relationship is is broken now and i don't i don't know if it can be fixed yeah i think that he may even be looking down on her from an elevation which is its own yeah uh, yeah I think interesting you're right. yeah. visual image yeah yeah and and again i think i love that this the setup with the the contacts is now being paid off here um but we don't like get an actual confirmation for why we're just getting more hints at it. Um, do you want my speculation on this? Absolutely. All right. So I'm guessing there's, there is a, a, um, a member of, of the slaughterhouse nine called Shatterbird, correct? Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing Shatterbird's power is to shatter things. Um, and we know she likes to go on reigns of terror through town. So I'm guessing that, wearing glasses right next to your eyes is probably not smart when someone named Shatterbird is flying around. So that's my speculation. All right, cool. Yeah, I wasn't, I actually didn't remember whether we had been given that information. And you know what, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, we might have, <laughs> that might sound less intelligent if we've no, already I, been given the information or not. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I think the information we were given last time was that it, it was something along the lines of Shatterbird likes to announce their presence in the city with a terror attack um, of some kind or like a massive attack of some kind. Yeah. And it's like, that's, you know, I'm not going to say whether you're right or wrong, but that's, uh, we'll find out. Yeah. Yeah. We'll find out. So then after that conversation, Taylor heads back showers and readies to claim her territory. Pretty nice and little we, opening chapter. Yeah. I, I, I agree about the, the dad interaction, the, the heartbreaking line for me for some reason was when he's like, I, I don't want to ask you to come home because I'm afraid you'll say no. Like for some reason that just, Got me right in the gut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't. I can't even imagine. That's awful. Yeah. So she, we, we skip ahead in time a bit into eleven point two, and uh, she's riding into her territory in a truck full of supplies with the eight uh, employees of Coil that she's uh, enlisted, all dressed basically looking like hazmat workers. She's thinking a lot about projecting an appearance of strength and authority here. She's she's really kind of micromanaging her her behavior in a very interesting way that that we could go into as they drive though she's collecting enormous numbers of bugs way more than she has before uh more than she's ever controlled at at the same time um and and i like you know in particular i was almost convinced i would finally see the upper limit of my power that i'd reach for more bugs and realize i couldn't control anymore it didn't happen the cloud <laughs> of bugs that were gathering in the center of my territory were starting to cast a visible shadow on the area what an image, man. I love it. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. It's like, I don't know. I don't know what to call it exactly, but it gives you such a sense of, of like, whoa. Like, because we, we've never seen her do anything like this before. You know, what, what does it say that Taylor has never stretched herself like this before? You know, even at this point, um, prior to how we see her go about controlling her territory, it's obvious that Taylor hasn't come close to exploring the scale of what she can do. We saw her bring two boxes of bugs to the art gallery fight, and we called that prepared. Yeah. And now we realize that she can call up a biblical plague. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it like it, it kind of never occurred to me that she would not have stretched her powers to their breaking point uh, until this scene. Um, I guess when you have no perceivable breaking point, it's kind of impossible to do that. Um, but it's it's so amazing that it seems like this doesn't have a limit. Like we know her limit is in range, right? Like if they're too far away, 
she can't control them, but there's no number limit. Like, and, and as we see, the number of bugs that she gathers doesn't affect her ability to control them at an individual level. Like, even with this huge swarm she's amassed, she still is able to like draw pictures with with bugs, like pictures of chicken, like a chicken bone, and like uh, the other stuff she does. So it, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, she's doing. She's doing. She, it basically just lets her do more things at once. She, she's not yeah. even really having to split her attention too much. She's using them partly, you know, for shock and awe, as we as we discussed, partly to create barriers across side streets, basically just to make sure that her dad doesn't like wander over to see what's happening and see her in costume, figure out it's her. Um, she uses them to tally up all the people in the area and, and track them, and she uses them to wake the people up that are in her territory. Um, and yeah, like you said, she draws picti- pictograms. Yeah, so she does uh, a lot of these things that are, at the same time, super badass and kind of incredibly scary at the same time. Um, yeah. I, we're going to talk more about this later, but Taylor's ability to effectively control a like area is astonishing, and it's something I never even considered before. Yeah, yeah, and and this is the first time that we've seen her. You know, we 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 started out much earlier, many arcs ago, talking about how. She seemed completely unaware of how she appears, and not only we've we've moved well past that now to the point that she's not only aware of how she appears, but she's being a little bit theatrical about it, uh, as we're about to see. Uh, because uh, so you know the truck stops and the crates of supplies are unloaded while she waits inside the truck, keeping herself hidden, and then she uses the swarm to draw everyone in, but she keeps them at bay from keeping from taking the supplies. Um, she, you know, she's judging the group. It's, it's very mixed. There are some groups of armed men, there are some families, and then she uses her bugs to create another swarm clone, which moves through the crowd and then flies into the back of the truck and then dissipates dramatically, leaving the impression that it has turned into her. And then she leaves the bugs dramatically swirling around her in loops and vortices. Yeah. I think my little reaction to this at this time was, holy shit. Um, because I can't even imagine what this looks like for people who know her as a villain and are seeing this. Like, it's got to be incredibly frightening. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, I mean, we know what she can do, but they, they have no idea what she can do. So they're, they're just going to take it at face value. Right. Now they think she literally can just turn into bugs. <laughs> yeah. Which is something that she's actually done before right. with, uh, with the skinheads at, at, at Rachel's place. So she addresses the the crowd with her creepy swarm voice, and she stakes her claim and says that she demands nothing from her subjects other than that they follow her rules and that other gangs are to be expelled. Uh, She tells them she will distribute basic supplies for everyone who behaves and more supplies to those who work for her. Yeah, I just wanted to to point out once again that uh, this girl is 15 years old at this point, um, and and she's doing this. And it's, it's, it's remarkable. I think it's saying something about how having these powers forces you to grow up a little bit. But what what I want to do is like broach the subject that I think you and I are probably going to be talking about over and over again throughout the rest of this arc, which is that um, Taylor's motivation for everything that she's doing here and throughout the arc is sound. Um, she, like in this situation, she wants to keep crying down. She wants to feed people. She's going to kick all the gangs out, no drugs. Her motivations are, are just, it's her actions that are a little suspect. And I just want to make sure we, we, we focus on that as we go through the rest of this arc. Yeah, that's absolutely true. It reminds me of, of the, like when she cut out Lung's eyes. It was like, yes, of course, that made perfect rational sense in the moment. But it's still a little, little bit of a red flag that she would do that. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's exactly the type of thing that we see over and over where we're like, yes, Taylor, I, I can follow your train of thought here. Um, but can you, we should maybe question why we're even having to have this train of thought in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So after her speech, uh, the people move in to collect the supplies and relatively quickly, there's a scuffle caused by a guy with a knife. She walks up to him and tries to threaten him into submission. Interestingly, doesn't try to talk him down. She's just like, stop. Uh, and then invites him to stab her when he doesn't back down. So he stabs her a few times, making no headway through her costume, uh, although it is like hurting her and it seems really dangerous to me. Yeah, I'm um, not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure what she was thinking <laughs> with that. I mean, I guess she's just trying to project an image and has this real sense of confidence um, yeah. that like she's a, a cape. She's skitter. This guy isn't special. He's normal. He can't even touch me. 
that's yeah. that's my only guess for why she was so so confident with this interaction there's also the factor i don't i don't know if we've discussed this at any point but i think taylor may not like bullies i don't know if that's come oh, up in yeah, the story yeah, yet. maybe maybe that's i i, I don't know we'll have yeah. to we'll have to check and see yeah <laughs> no that's very true yeah, so she she retaliates covering him in her horrifying capsaicin bugs and then crushes his his hand and takes his knife uh, and then battery intervenes before she can use it although she had indeed planned to maim him with it yeah and i think that's the most important part of this uh interaction is that taylor was fully ready and prepared to slice this guy up with a knife um yeah. not kill him of course that's important <laughs> she was not going to kill him um but she was going to take this weapon and hurt him severely. And I think that's what we're talking about when we're talking about suspect action. I mean, this is straight up, this is a villain move here. Yeah. This is another one of those places when, during my first read through, I was like, yes, Taylor, cut him. Um, <laughs> and and now going through this more slowly and thoughtfully, I'm like, interesting. I, I missed a lot of uh, what was kind of going on here. Um, yeah, so. especially since it, it's very clear at the end of this interaction that cutting this guy up was not necessary. He, he got the picture or at least um, even if he didn't get the picture, she was fully capable of taking them out later anyway. So like, it's not a necessary thing to do. I mean, unfortunately, like what it mostly would do is it would serve as an effective, like terror tactic against the people who are watching. Yeah. Many of whom are, you know, innocent and Yeah. So uh, Battery, again, has intervened. So she and Battery have a parlay where Battery admits that she's not going to try to arrest Taylor slash Skitter because there are bigger fish to fry. The undersiders aren't a high priority right now. Um, one interesting thing Battery says, no, knowing what you tried to pull with pretending to be a villain or pretending to be a hero that's pretending to be a villain, you're more likely to have some scheme in play than anyone else. So I just like this as a very succinct expression of how the heroes feel about Taylor at this point. Yeah, I think any any goodwill she had with any of them, uh, if it ever existed, is gone. Um, I, I really enjoy this, and I think it it's smart that it was, the battery was the one to have this interaction because this is someone we haven't seen very much uh, in the past. I mean, we've seen her fight a little bit, but there not not a lot of detail. Um, and and she seems like someone that's like generally good and well-meaning. And so we haven't had previous interactions to kind of color her, her reaction to us. So we see Taylor on the opposite side of this person that on the surface seems like they care just as much about um, the people of the city that she does uh, with her actions. But they're on the opposite side and they could eventually come to blows. And, and you kind of get the feeling that um, at this this truce quote unquote uh because they have more important things to worry about it is definitely only temporary and if this was any other moment in the city that they would be fighting right now yeah i think that's fair so so the net effect of the interaction with battery seems to be that skitter is just even more legitimized in the eyes of the crowd <laughs> yeah that didn't really work out battery right it turns out there aren't enough boxes so she gives ladybug trackers to the families that haven't gotten supplies yet isn't this weird? <laughs> I mean, like, it's cool. It's really cool. But it's just like, here, let these bugs just hang out on you for a few hours. I'll bring you some food later. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the logistics of that are kind of funny. I, I agree. Uh, so the people leave, but one remains, a redhead with dreadlocks. She tells her story to Taylor after Taylor, you know, uh, asks her what's up. And she asks for Skitter's help. Uh, because the merchants have kidnapped her brother. Hey, Matt. Do, yes. Do you ever do you ever get the feeling that Wild Bo's just like intentionally fucking with our emotions? Yes, um, Scott. <laughs> I read Twig, so yes. <laughs> so this chapter, uh, this arc, even it is about Taylor embracing her villainy. But of course, we can't just do that. So we have to have in the same arc where she's embracing her villainy, we have to have her go on what is like ostensibly her first hero mission <laughs> like yeah. she's she, for the rest of this arc the goal of her actions is to save a kid who's been kidnapped by the terrible people um so it, it's 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 just it's just amazing that we have these two things and they're existing at the same time and it's just showing you like how blurred these lines between good and bad and hero and villain are within this world yeah right she's exactly what you said she's there's <laughs> 
this is what people talk about when they talk about the gray morality, I think, in the story, because it's it's such a gradient. Like, yeah, she's she may not be as uh, as upstanding a good guy as, I don't know, Miss Militia, but there's definitely a lot of wrongs below her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we keep we keep seeing them. Yeah. So we move into 11.3. Yeah. And this before we get started, I just want to say this is my favorite chapter in the entirety of Worm. Uh, so far, which is probably a crazy thing to say because it's not very emotionally impactful. Impactful. It's not like the biggest event uh, of the series so far, but just like from a writing perspective, like it's just structurally done so well that like I reread this entire chapter like four times before this this uh, podcast just to because I was just loving it so much, I'm loving how the information was doled out to us and how it was structured. Ah, oh, so yeah. Cool. I definitely remember this as being very satisfying the first time through and, and it is, it is really, really fun. Like you feel like you're in a sense, getting something you've been waiting for, even though you didn't know you were waiting for it. I'd love to hear as we go more detail on, on what you got out of it exactly though. Yeah. It just like, I, I think the, the arc just kind of, or the chapter rather, um, the juxtaposition that happens kind of threw me off at first. And then there's like a moment where you realize what, while Bo's doing and then it's just like magical you're just like yeah. oh <laughs> yes. it's just like i loved it i loved it yes we're, we're gonna get into that structural choice here so the juxt the, the juxtaposition that's happening between these two threads that we're going to talk about um we're, we're going to see taylor act as a violent detached tea drinking supervillain alternating with a compassionate heroine so we open with Taylor monitoring her territory from the comfort of her giant villain chair and finding two groups of armed merchants entering her territory. She doesn't just attack them and drive them away, which we now realize she could easily do. She uses strategies that she learned from Bakada, or really indirectly from Lung, to psychologically torment them and ensure that they don't come back and that they spread the word about how terrible she is. Yeah, and in this moment, we see that realization that she learned it from Bakuda, and there's this little mini argument she has with herself. Um, and I just, I love, I love how awesome it is to be in Taylor's point of view at some of this stuff, because like, there's the moment it's like, why did that line of thinking sound so familiar? And then it dawned on me, Bakuda. And she just goes, well, that was disquieting. Still, my reasons were different. I dismissed that line of thinking, and she just yeah. moves on. <laughs> like, right. It's like... It's just like this incredible way of um, justifying all this stuff internally. And you get to see that back and forth in her head. But it just like it happens so fast. But it's just really well done. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, I, I found a way to, to live with this. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm done. So again, even though she could immediately steamroll them here, she makes swarm clones uh, so that the attack seems to have a more malevolent agency than just like a vague bunch of bugs. She makes an example of one of the merchants while the other swarm clones just eerily hang back. And she's actually sort of like taking apart two separate groups here. Not not quite at the same time, I don't think, but but in rapid succession. And she's doing it all from the comfort of her chair, not exposing herself to any risk at all. Uh, she pins she pins them up uh, with her bugs, and she ups the pressure until they panic and break. And then she gives one of them an exit and then traps him when he takes it and then punishes him, too. Yeah, she's like literally a James Bond villain. I mean, like, that's exactly what's happening now. She's, yeah. <laughs> she's sitting in a chair and sending her minions out and yeah. it, reveling in it. Yeah, from, from the comfort of her, of her lair. Yeah. And then, of course, the line, I finished my tea, then made a face. The tea bag had leaked grit, and some had settled into the bottom of my cup. Bitter. I love this <laughs> so much. These are the greatest three sentences <laughs> I've ever read. Um, like, I'm being hyperbolic, but, like, this, like, it's so perfect. The imagery, like, just the sentence structure, just, like, there's the, the word bitter being that only sentence. It's yeah. just, like, it, it, it like, just lands like and it does exactly what it needs to like this this level of like indifference toward this whole thing right it's just wonderful yeah you you expressed it perfectly right there i i was trying to grasp for what exactly it was that, that was so delightful about this and it's exactly what you just said it's 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 capturing her just like 30 percent of her attention is on is on beating these these guys and Currently, she's preoccupied with her tea leaking, leaking grit yeah. into. Oh, I love it so much. So at this point, 
we switch back in time to her unhesitatingly agreeing to save uh, Sierra. We learn the dreadlock girl's name, Sierra's brother. So she tells Coyle's guys to go home and that they deserve a bonus. And, uh, and then she agrees to, uh, you know, to help her. And she, you know, the, the, the exact wording she uses is in her own head. I didn't even have to think about it. Yeah. And I think when we talk about why the structure of this chapter is so good, it's, it's this right here, because the, the line about the T is literally two sentences above this. Um, Mm -hmm. And then suddenly we're here to, I didn't even have to think about it. I didn't have to think about helping you out. Of course I'm going to help you out. And it's this tonal whiplash. Like, like it it almost knocks you out. Like you're just like, like how different these two people are. That's the same character. Um, And like it, that's why I love how it's structured because it, it's really not afraid to show us these two different sides of her. Um, and, and I think we're going to see after this, how these sides are going to blend, but like, that's just the brilliance of the structure of this. I love it. And we're yeah, going to do it I, again here in a few minutes. Yeah. I, I may be drawing too much, too much out of this here. Tell me if, tell me if you agree, but it seems to me that she's able to be like completely like sociopathically almost indifferent toward people who she's put in in a bin as being bullies and just overwhelmingly compassionate toward people who she sees as victims absolutely and and what you're seeing here is villain taylor is super effective as a villain because once she sees somebody as a bully they're they're just scum to her um but she's also still has that heroic streak of willing to be the champion of of the victims and the underdogs and these are both completely consistent character tra- traits that coexist at the same time um and a very believable kind of breaking bad um um you know arc for this character of coming to justify worse and worse things in the name of of this um, you know, defense of the innocent, essentially. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think we don't use the the word bully enough um, because mm-hmm. we've moved past it as a, a literal um, event into a more abstract how she views people that are not directly bullying her or bullying other people as bullies. But yeah, I think you're right. I think we need to f- try to focus on using that word more. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I think you're absolutely correct. Um, okay. That's 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 her compartmentalization and she's not just compartmentalizing internal stuff she puts people into compartments um yeah. you belong in this compartment and therefore these actions are justifiable um you in this compartment so yes of course i'm going to help you i'm not going to think about it yeah. um, and I, I think that's that's wonderful and i think you're right the structure of this chapter paints that picture for us just perfectly mm-hmm. yeah I think she doesn't even feel guilt about the things she does to people once she's once she's categorized them as bullies. I mean, she does to a certain extent. Um, you know, I she, she's just e- easily able to work past the guilt. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's probably more fair. Yeah. So Sierra's story is pretty sad. Um, I'm not going to go into the full details of it, but basically, it's it it's going into the ground level view of how terrible life is in Brockton Bay now. The whole it's like the whole city is homeless shelters and refugees living in demolished buildings. So um, as she tells the story, though, Sierra is repeatedly surprised by Skidder's compassion uh, as she tells it. Uh, her family tried to find a shelter here in various places and then was split up when several of them fell extremely ill due to toxic mold. And then the merchants attacked the shelter that she and her brother were staying at and they took him. And uh, special attention is paid toward the pretty graphic sadism of the merchants toward the innocent shelter inhabitants. Yeah. And this is just us swimming in this, this pool of moral grayness. Um, because I mean, we're, we're setting up the merchants as easily identifiable bad guys. There's like no doubt that these are bad guys and they, they need to be taken out of power. But like, on the other hand, like Taylor just finished kind of torturing them with glee. So it's like, like it, it, the story is refusing to give you an easy answer. And yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's very organic too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to highlight this, cause it's going to come up later. Sierra is saying, so I think it should mean something extra, something special when I'm telling you to hurt them, fuck them up, hurt them as much as you think they deserve. Then double that triple it. Just, just, Just make them. I put a hand on her shoulder and she flinched. I left the hand there and I measured out my words. Trust me when I say I have that handled. 
And uh, I think we believe Taylor at this point. Oh, yeah. Um, it's terrifying because I absolutely do believe her that that, that was said with utmost sincerity. She's not trying to play a game. She's not trying to win this woman to her side. She means it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't even think it's posturing. She's just like, no, it, it, yep. it won't be a problem. Yeah. So Sierra describes her brother and the attackers and she and um, uh, Skitter invites slash command Sierra to come back to her lair with her down through the pitch black storm drain. Uh, just as a, as a side note, it's probably terrifying to be taken down into a storm drain by like a spider themed cape who's being alternately really <laughs> nice and terrifying. Yeah. Something about parlors and spiders and flies comes to mind. <laughs> so Skitter makes tea. Uh, but Sierra has fallen asleep before she gets back with the tea. Yeah, and I, and I wanted to point out, this is our second beat in our three beat, um, where Taylor says that the, I think she's called a villain by Sierra, and she says, I'm not offended, I am a villain. And then she goes on this long diatribe about how she's also a person, um, and she likes all these things. She likes tea more than coffee. She goes to try to kind of like personalize and humanize herself. Um, I, I think... I think we're seeing her frustration at being dehumanized and being labeled a villain, but also like, didn't she just in the last chapter, like go out of her way to label and, and to dehumanize herself, like to, mm-hmm. to affect these people around them. I really like that, like that, that difference between those two. Yeah. I think we maybe can even watch her perspective on these things shifting in real time. So at this point we Tarantino back, um, forward in time i guess over to her using the bugs uh to light a constant to uh, to light a match um and we kind of have to put the scene together from clues i I love how that's done it's 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 not it's like a cold open in the middle of her trying to do something and we see that one of the merchant women has dropped her gas can and gas gasoline is splattered everywhere including her her shoes and pants and skitter has stolen her matches with the bugs and now is making all the bugs advance slowly towards her carrying the lit matches like a mob of torch waving peasants as the woman tries to frantically strip off her gas soaked clothes while her friends try to help and skitter just kind of after terrorizing them a while makes a huge tower out of bugs and then drops it on them yeah and i think again this is where the structure of the chapters is doing laps for us because we cut from this adorable scene where taylor almost literally like tucks a person into bed um and then we we cut from that to her trying to set people on fire with an army of match wielding bugs it's like this it's such a like crazy juxtaposition but it like it does and like at this point we've like this is when i realized what what wildbo was doing and like the point drilled home about how much we're trying to juxtapose these two sides and it's just like it just like it like eye-opening and it's wonderful like i loved it so much yeah yeah when when the woman burns her hand taylor literally thinks to herself something like i couldn't really be bothered about this because she was trying to burn other people she's like my god like, the callousness <laughs> yeah, is i know strong yeah. in this one yeah um I, and i love the text that she sends to coil where she says uh merchant burn victim and other wounded near sandstone and harney send medic and i just love it <laughs> there's a question mark like I don't know. The way I read that is like, if you want, you know, I don't know yeah, whatever. It, it's, it's up to you. Yeah. yeah I, it's, it is really the small touches that you, you kind of fall in love with sometimes. Yeah. So having polished off the merchant invaders without getting out of her chair, uh, Skitter calls Tattletail. The other undersiders, it turns out, are way behind where Skitter is. Gru can't even find his enemies because he doesn't have bug clairvoyance. And Tattletail, although she knows a lot, can't really quickly root out uh, her enemies because she doesn't have bug akinesis. And uh, they're both working together, though, to try to slowly root out uh, the gang members and other other baddies in their territory. So in general, it's becoming, by contrast, how you know obvious how Skitter's power is superbly well suited to being an overlord over normal humans. Yeah. And we, we touched on this briefly before. But yeah, I mean, this is incredible. Like she is beating the pants off of every other person uh, that's setting out to do this. And this got me thinking about her bug powers again because like i've constantly underestimated these powers like from the first moment i was reading this this book i've constantly underestimated her and it made me think about like that decision to center the story around her and a person with these level of powers and 
the, the bug powers work because they're a metaphor for um, for Taylor and, and the result of her bullying and how it made her feel. But it's like it's a power that's so mutable and like capable of expansion and using different things that it just allows the reader to never get bored of hanging out with her because she's always doing something different with these powers. And it's 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 so funny that that happened because like when you first told me like what the story about centered on a person who c- control bugs, I'm like, how do, how do you make that, that? How do you make that interesting for as long as this, this story was, but, but it does it. Cause uh, you know, wild Bo keeps finding new and interesting things to do with these powers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and there's, there's definitely a ton of growth because even stuff like the fact that she's doing all of the stuff she's doing remotely, I think she couldn't have done at the start because I don't think she, really was that good with the bug senses uh, yeah, like right. she is now it's like now she she thinks nothing of conducting a battle entirely through through her like bug eyes but i think that's kind of a new thing so it's not that her it's not that her power is becoming stronger it's that she's becoming better at her power and yeah, i think that's uh, absolutely that, that's great to watch it's it's fun so she questions Lisa about the merchants, and Lisa has indeed found out a lot about them. And she tells her, uh, she Lisa tells Taylor that the merchants are having a big party tonight, and invites her to attend. Oh yeah, we're going to a party. Yeah. I'm excited. Looking forward to this. <laughs> Eleven point four. She makes her way to Lisa's headquarters. Uh, so Lisa is, and she doesn't have a lair the way Taylor does. She's essentially pretending to work at while secretly being in charge of a shelter slash community center type building, which allows a high rate flow of people and therefore information for Tattletale to work with. And we get the sense that she's also using the mercenaries a lot behind the scenes. Yeah. And I do like how this highlights how um, the powers of the person kind of dictate how their management style of their district. Like we saw Taylor just make a large scale thing. Lisa's like being a, uh, like covert and gathering information it makes me wonder like how Gru is gonna hold on to his because like his power is really pow- strong but it doesn't seem like suited to like large-scale uh management um and also his personality does not seem very suited to large-scale like people management because he's not a very good leader um so i i'm, I'm really curious as how like how he's gonna hold his territory what his strategy is gonna be i hope we get to see more of that later yeah, I mean, it, it's hard for me to imagine anything that doesn't just involve a lot of punching right. in the dark. Yeah, um, it, it is. I don't know if you've said that you think he's not a very good leader before, but that's interesting. I, I, I don't necessarily want to challenge you on that, but yeah, I is, mean, it maybe, is interesting. That that's kind of like soaked in as your perspective at this point. I just I, he he just and that probably wasn't a good phrase. I think he's good leader strategically. I just don't think he manages the people in his team very well, um, and I think that's like kind of what you have to do if you're going to, you're going to control territory um, in this kind mm-hmm. of sense. So maybe that's more what I meant. Not specifically that he's a bad leader. Um, he's just not good at people management. Yeah. He does seem very often frustrated with the other team members. Yeah. I can see your perspective. I know we should be arguing Scott, but I just can't. I can't do it. <laughs> you're Unnatural. wrong, Matt. Yeah. I'm right. Okay. <laughs> Damn it. So, uh, <laughs> So there's there's a map on the wall of uh, Tattletail's building showing everyone who comes in um, the various parts of the city and how safe they are, uh, which is also subtly biasing people in favor of Skitter by marking her territory as relatively safe. Yeah, do we I mean, do we think this is like an intentional move on Lisa's part to like funnel more people to Taylor who can clearly handle them and manage them much easier with her? I, I would guess. Police yeah, bugs? I mean, I think it's I think it's at, at the very least biasing everyone towards the undersiders territories um, and, and against the territories that aren't controlled by the undersiders. That was my impression. Yeah, that least. makes sense. So Tattletail, once uh, Taylor makes contact with her, leads her back into the more secret sort of command center area packed with computers and walls covered with photos and maps of all their enemies, as well as some of the big mysteries in the story. Um, again, I'm, I'm always happy to see characters actually caring about and thinking about the big mysteries in their own damn world. Yeah, and I think most importantly, for me at least, from the brief glance of these walls we get, it doesn't seem like Lisa has any information uh, about these big mysteries that we slash Taylor don't. Um, 
you know, Lost ended seven years ago tonight. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm going to talk about Lost again, because one of the things that drove me crazy about that story was that um, there are all these things that characters know, but we don't get to know them just because characters don't talk to each other. And it doesn't seem like Worm has done this or, or and, and hasn't done it yet. It might do it in the future, but like, it doesn't seem, seem like we're intentionally like hiding information just because a character won't sit down and talk to another character. And if they're not sharing information, it's for a specific story reason, not just we don't want to reveal this to the audience yet. So these characters can't interact. Um, sorry, lost. Right. You just drive me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying so hard to avoid becoming derailed and talking about lost. Here, so gonna, <laughs> we don't have time today. Ahead. Maybe yeah, one day. Maybe, yeah. yeah. So they, they briefly talk about uh, the awkwardness that now exists within the Undersiders and how confessing her feelings to Brian may have made things worse. And uh, Lisa, th- hearing about this for the first time, basically is annoyed with Brian. Actually, no, it's not the first time, but she, she's annoyed with Brian. Um, but Taylor tells her not to interfere, even though she's inclined to. Yeah, I love I love Lisa here. Like I, I've talked over and over again how much I love the character of Lisa. Uh, I love her in this whole chapter. I love how her, her method of gathering information is to just help a bunch of people, because she actually is part of this, uh, this area that's literally helping people, which is wonderful. Um, but, uh, but once again, we see how important Taylor is to her, and, and she... She wants to be involved in this. She wants to help out. She knows she can, and she wants to, and that's great. Yeah, yeah, it, it is cool to to see some fairly unequivocal signs of Lisa being like a decent person. I think. Yeah. So the four escorts to the party arrive. Um, they're mostly scary military-looking guys. We have Jaw, Brooks, Miner, and Senegal, and we get quick but very distinctive. Um, sketches for each of them their appearances their their traits in general senegal uh, immediately seems like a creep he puts a hand on taylor under the guise of acting as a chaperone while basically just trying to exert physical dominance taylor tells him hands off but he doesn't comply until lisa orders him to and then a, a moment later in private lisa admits to taylor some that there are some very touchy logistical problems uh, involved in managing the personalities of all these mercenaries. Yeah, and I think this is another thing that's cool about how we're demonstrating the differences between these two characters and the difference between their two powers. Because Taylor doesn't have to worry about this kind of thing. Um, because her powers allow her to operate pretty much by herself. Lisa can't work that way. Her power gives her advantages, but she needs that muscle. Um, so Lisa's required to put up with these guys. Taylor isn't. And how they interact with them... Uh, kind of shows that that difference in character yeah plus taylor could legitimately take on all four of these guys yeah, yeah. assuming she wasn't like standing right in front of them whereas tattletale is just like a person um yeah you know, so big difference there of course they don't know that they don't know who she is did you uh, did you find something a little weird with the fact that um in order to go to this party everyone's like broken off into pairs and uh, Tattletail makes Jaw and Brooks end up as a, a gay couple for some reason. Um, <laughs> like, I don't see why practically every single member of the group needed to be coupled off. Um, it could have just been like two couples and then their two friends that came along with them. Um, my only guess is here. This is like both Lisa just fucking with them and also like asserting herself as the leader of this group. Like, you have to do what I say. Um, that's the only explanation I could come up with. Yeah, it could have been that. It could have been like she was joking and then Brooks was offended by it. And so then she had to, had to double down on it. I don't know. (laughs) I like that more actually. (laughs) Yeah. Because, because it almost does come off as joking. Um, Yeah. I don't know. The whole, the interaction between these mercenaries is unfortunately not something we're going to have much time to get into, but they're all delightful individuals unto themselves. Yeah. And I think that's a a testament that to the writing that it, it spends time with these relatively minor characters and we get to know their pretty distinct personalities uh, very quickly and we were with them through the rest of this arc so it, it, it is cool yeah so as uh, taylor and tattletale taylor talking um they mention uh, lisa mentioned something she's arrived at she says uh okay here's my theory then i think your power is strongest when you're closest to the situation where you had your trigger event 
and then goes on to say the really scary part is that it might be doing us a disservice because it works like a Pavlovian trigger, like how the dog who hears the bell ringing every time he gets food starts to drool when he hears the bell. This might actually, uh, sorry, this might subtly uh, be subtly urging us back into ugly, violent, or dangerous situations with the benefits of having our powers temporarily boosted. Yeah, um, so this kind of tosses my whole powers get activated when you're in imminent danger theory kind of out the window. Um, I think it's not exactly that, so I'm going to go ahead and call that speculation wrong. Um, But it's fine because I like this a lot better. Um, It's like taking PTSD and attaching superpowers to it. Um, And like Lisa says here, it's almost worse than just regular PTSD because no one's incentivized to ever get over their trauma. Like, mm-hmm. it's literally their trauma that fuels them, and this explains kind of why the world is in the state it is, because, like, your trauma fuels your ability to knock over buildings and uh, erase people from existence and shoot lasers and all this crazy stuff. Um, and yeah, that's like, of course the world's messed up, because that's that's the reality. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I don't want to get too far off track here but i think you should even go on like a cape by cape basis and talk about like that cape's level of like success um you know graft versus whether or not they indulge kind of uh those impulses of of yeah putting themselves in those situations i think you're probably right yeah yeah so uh yeah, basically, she, she she finishes saying it, it's it's kind of like a defense mechanism. The worse the situation gets, the stronger you'll get, which is very similar to what you said, I think. Um, I guess but, kind of. But I, yeah, I, I I don't think it's quite what I meant when I said it. And yeah. it's not it's it's far enough away where I'm willing to call it wrong and okay. saying this is much cooler. Yeah, I mean, I think this has a crucial you know distinction that makes it that makes it more thematically and, and metaphorically resonant. Yeah, and then it comes up, and Lisa once again demurs when asked when asked about her trigger event. Hey, Matt. Yes, guy. I got I got speculation. All right. So knowing what we know about trigger events, I'm ready to guess at what Lisa's trigger event was. So excited. Okay, so my guess here is that Lisa had a sister or has a sister, um, either younger or older. I don't think it matters. Um, who got hurt or died? in some way that uh, I think Taylor specifically reminds her of the sister and Lisa triggered um, because of the hurt or dying. And and it was around the fact that she blamed herself for not having enough information or not noticing signs of things or not being able to infer information from uh, things that were presented to her. Um, So that's my guess for that. It it, it seems like the pieces fit together so perfectly that that's probably one of the most confident (laughs) speculations I've had, but um, I think that just fits so well, and it, it, it explains everything about Lisa that um, has been kind of up in the air at this point. So that's my guess. All right. That's, that's amazing. Okay. Um, so there's more to this conversation, um, but uh, I, think, I think we've hit on the main points of this conversation yeah. that we want to draw out. I think so, yeah. So, so uh, they, they, at the end of this chapter, they arrive at the Weymouth Shopping Center, the, the famous recurring Weymouth Shopping Center, which... I just love this element of the story. And the merchants at the door are handing out red wristbands for bloodshed. Dun, dun, dun. Again, there's so many yeah. cliffhangers. Yeah. The, the wristband thing isn't something that I've highlighted, but basically the, the idea is that they've identified that the, the merchants wear wristbands that mean something, and they seem to mean like you have more experience with the merchants if you have more wristbands. Yeah, you get... It's like you're... Uh, it's like... Uh, when you go to a concert, you get a wristband, except you yeah. keep it for some reason. Yeah. Whatever. It makes sense. Yeah. So we move, we move into 11.5. Um, so even though the description doesn't quite match, I always like to imagine the Weymouth Shopping Center at this point looking like the dystopian Gotham from a Schumacher Batman movie. All neon spray paint and blaring discordant music and defaced construction equipment and trash can fires and random fights breaking out. Just total visual and auditory chaos. Yeah, I I like that a lot. Uh, I went Mad Max with it, but that's probably less accurate. (laughs) Um, uh, And your description makes me laugh a lot more, so it's going to be in my head, uh, Batman Forever now. (laughs) 
Do you like that? Do you like that? Yeah. I got the I, jokes I, I, over I, here. That's why people listen that. for my amazing jokes. Yeah, it's true. So the two mercs pretending to be the gay couple get stopped at the door. Uh, and Lisa subtly orders them to take down the guards, which they do viciously. And then the whole group moves inside. I'm just going to refer to this group as the team or team strike force. OK, uh, because otherwise I'm going to have to just like say a lot of names. Uh, so immediately the vendors inside start trying to sell them hookers, drugs, stolen goods, etc. Uh, Lisa buys some ecstasy just to fit in and pretends to give Taylor some to take. Yeah, and I think this is the, like really the first time that we're seeing like this amount of real depravity that's like taken hold of Brockton Bay. Like we're seeing it right up front and center. Um, and and these are the people that are in power now. Like they're some of the most disgusting human beings we've we've seen thus far in the story. And we just finished hanging out with Alec. So um, yeah. I, I see this again, once again, as as Wild Bo really attempting to challenge our notions of of good and bad. Um, Taylor taking over this this block of a city is an authoritarian play, like propped up by her fear, violence, and her power. Um, but compared to these guys, Taylor is like an angel. Um, but the authority with which she wields that power wasn't really earned. Um, it wasn't selected. She just asserted herself. So, like, if we pretend that the merchants are a cancer to the city, then Taylor is like chemotherapy, including all the side effects that come from that. So we have these these two opposing things. One seems better than the other, but with with what kind of consequences? And I just love that. I love that we're seeing this and how this plays out. I like your metaphor quite a lot there. Thank you. So eventually the team settles on a spot and starts looking for Bryce. Um, As they're looking, though, very quickly, Taylor is distracted because in the window of a former women's clothing shop is something like a burlesque show with dancers who don't all seem to be willing participants. Taylor singles out one in particular who looks terrified uh, and is obviously really young, and Taylor demands immediately that that the team help her. Um, yeah. Yeah, there, there's a whole lot going on here, but one of the things, big things I wanted to point out was that Taylor makes this observation that... Um, there's this social cooperation on a twisted level. Like every guy in the crowd wants these girls, but they're all stopping each other from grabbing them and taking them away and doing unspeakable things to them. And it's only because right now the current benefit, it benefits everyone if they just stay that way. And I kind of saw this as like a metaphor for the state of Brockton Bay as a whole right now. Um, the city's kind of just running on borrowed time. And there's this group that's in power that like is really just surviving off of, like uh, this sense of like self benefit um, group think type of thing, but like as soon as they get bored, it's probably going to all collapse and destroy itself. And I thought this yeah. was like a really a fitting like microcosm of the entire situation in the city. Yeah, I I, I think that's perfect. I did, I did not make that connection, but I think that's exactly true. There's also the fact I don't remember when she when she thinks this, but there's the fact that the merchants before the disaster were, were literally just the scum of the city and, and there weren't that many of them and they weren't powerful. Yeah. But now, now Taylor's thinking like how many people are in the merchants now? Is it like one in 50 Brockton Bay residents? Like the, the water line for, for becoming this kind of person appears to be rising uh, due to essentially the pressures of living in the city. Um, and, and as as these pressures mount, it's more and more tempting to kind of join that herd that you described. Yeah, and she she I think she specifically says that it's getting harder to believe in in humanity by mm-hmm. the day. Um, yeah. and I think I think she's right to a certain extent that when when terrible things like this happen, people's willingness to commit horrible actions um, to survive, or their perception of survive, or for a feeling of that there's no going to be no punishment for my actions like ramps up. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it's depressing. Yeah. So yeah, at this point, Taylor's insisting on, uh, on saving this girl tattletale saying, this is going to be a huge distraction. This is going to expose us. Um, and says, uh, you know, uh, you've got a little superhero showing through there. She whispered right into my ear. Yeah. And I think this, follows your your train of thought exactly that if someone is perceived as a victim uh taylor will do whatever it takes to help them 
So this this girl has fallen under the victim category, and now Taylor acts, and we see that juxtaposition. She flips again, and now she's superhero. So she's gonna she's gonna help her out. And and in that moment, you're like, fuck yeah! Like she she's got yeah. superhero coming through. You're excited, um, and 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 you see that good core of her. Um, I think I think when she sees per- things perceived as wrong, she acts on it, right? And I think the the key to Taylor is just kind of turning that perception inward a little. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's interesting how forceful she is. She's like, look, I'm just going to, I'm just going to use my bugs and blow this whole thing. If, <laughs> if you don't, and it's like, geez, I mean, relax. <laughs> yeah. Just, nope. Done like bullies, Matt. Nope. Not at all. So uh miner uh, walks up, grabs, grabs the girl and throws money into the air as a distraction. And uh, the team, including Taylor has to fight their way out uh, quite, quite viciously. Uh, and, uh, Taylor and Miner with the girl and Telltale run to a, a distant area to hunker down. And once they get there, the girl hugs and thanks Taylor. And Taylor thinks I, hu- I hugged her back reflexively, a little shaken. Why had it taken this long for someone to say that, uh, to say that simple thing to me? I'd wanted to be a hero once upon a time. <laughs> so here's, here's the question I want to ask Taylor in this moment. What event prior to this does she think someone should have thanked her for <laughs> because i'm i'm drawing a blank right now so I, I, that's i love this moment because it's like this this compartmentalization this rationalization of hers like is 100 percent in here why hadn't someone thanked me before i guess the only thing that comes to my mind when you put it that way is is the fact that she fought leviathan and the fact that she tried to help the heroes but yeah I, I, yeah that, that, i mean that's that's, that's all i could come up with too but that's such yeah. more abstract and larger scale than some an individual person is going to walk up and say thank you yeah um, it's like yeah what taylor did, did you thank the other heroes who were there right I mean, exactly yeah 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 so then suddenly the girl who they've rescued recognizes taylor as the locker girl which is just so demeaning uh taylor denies it uh but when when the girl persists taylor snaps at her um the girl says something along the lines of oh i i I wanted to say something and taylor says but you didn't i growled at her just like everyone else you left me in that locker you didn't go to get help you didn't report the people who did it not even anonymously you felt bad you wanted to help is that supposed to mean something to me is it supposed to be some consolation you were too lazy or cowardly to step up and do anything about it but hey at least your heart was in the right fucking place huh so first of all this draws into relief a lot of what we've been saying about bullies and victims yeah yeah and and it really doesn't seem like taylor's over it scott no not at all um and this i think this ties into what we were talking about before that i'm I'm not sure if a cape is capable of getting over their trauma because their trauma is what fuels them and drives them and it's like every single super powered person in this entire world needs to go to a psychologist like right now because Like that's that's what's happening is they're not getting over the the thing that birthed them as a superhero, um, and and I do I I love that how this fits into your, your comment about uh, bullies and victims and now we've seen this girl flip from one to the other in Taylor's mind instantly, um, and and she lashes out immediately because of it. Good point. Yeah, I, I didn't notice that, but I think you're exactly right. Uh, and then the girl tries to defend herself to Taylor verbally, of course, and, and starts to say something about Emma Barnes, but she gets cut off. So do you part of me wonders what would have happened if she didn't get cut off? Because I think to Taylor, a bully uh, deflecting blame and pushing it on something else is like the worst thing you can do. Um, so I wonder like how much more this would have escalated between the two of them had they not been interrupted and had that train of thought continued. Yeah, I don't. I, I think you're probably right. I think it probably is better for her that she got cut off there. So it turns out that Jaw has found Bryce, and uh, Brooks has come to fetch Taylor and the others to where they have Bryce secured. Um, so it turns out Bryce has obviously not been kidnapped by the merchants. Um, he's joined the merchants. I like how Bryce's rationale for joining the merchants has its own very consistent internal logic. And you can actually really buy a person making that choice in that situation while you still judge him for it. Yeah, I I really agree. It is a nice reflection on, on Taylor's ability to kind of do the same thing. 
Um, because didn't Taylor join a gang of criminals to get away from a terrible life at home? <laughs> I mean, she technically did. Uh, and, and of course, Bryce is infinitely more selfish. I'm not going to say that. The Undersiders are certainly a completely different league than the terribleness that is the merchants. But he suffered trauma and he ran away from it to join with a gang of criminals. I mean, it's very similar. Um, I- I'm certainly not saying that it's the same at all, but I think it's intentionally similar in this this uh, moment. Oh, Scott, she was she was always planning to betray the oh, undersiders. Of course, of course. Yeah. 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 And of course, we see Lisa um, lie to someone again to manipulate them. Uh, Lisa tells uh, Bryce that his sister was hurt and is in the ICU. Um, you know, everyone gets on my case when I say Lisa does this stuff. But then Lisa does this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's like her. It's like her main thing. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's how she operates. That's why Doesn't whenever mean we I don't hear, like her guys. Yeah, I love her, but whenever whenever she's talking to a character, I can't help but wonder if there's some manipulation going on there because that's what she does. Yeah. So uh, before the team can convince Bryce to leave with them, though, Skidmark, leader of the merchants, and the Cape members of the merchants start holding court. Um, just we get a short description of some of them, although they're apparently more of them and, and we don't know who they are or what their powers are um just as an aside i love that mush is basically described as looking like Gollum, but with no explanation like we we're not given any information about whether he's a k-53 or just really ugly <laughs> no um, yeah so overall there there's more capes than expected and it seems that the merchants have been recruiting capes yeah and they have the dumbest names ever matt i can't get over how bad these <laughs> names are but it's in like it, it, and I'm not saying like Wildbow gave them dumb names. I'm saying these guys are terrible at naming themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think they're like intentionally disgusting. Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Skidmark um, starts to build his arena um, in the uh, in in the open area in the middle of the mall. So basically, his power is he creates these like areas where there's there's like a lack of friction and like a wind essentially, or maybe just some kind of net force in a direction pushing people in the direction he chooses. So he, he's building a, a series of these in like a square on the ground. And the, and the, the effect of it is that it, it, anyone who's inside it is kind of trapped inside it. Anyone who falls onto his, um, his bands of force gets thrown into it. So I, I can barely describe how cool it is that in in your mind his power goes from like that's the dumbest thing ever to oh that's kind of cool i can see that might be useful in a fight um in the span of of like a minute as he starts using it yeah so uh yeah he he creates this arena i really like that you put it that way because that's kind of exactly how my uh train of thought went that is like the guy with a, a shitty name a shitty personality like a, a shitty power and i was like oh wait no it's, i guess it's kind of a cool power yeah one thing I like about it is that um, he, he's clever with it. You know, he, it's he, we see him a few times in the scene, use it kind of cleverly. Yeah. Absolutely. So it turns out that this is going to be a free for all battle between pretty much everybody who got trapped in the arena and anybody who wants to jump in. And the last five standing are going to get as a reward powers in a can. Uh, plus, we can expect some triggers in the melee. Yeah, and I think this uh, is our first official confirmation of, of that fact. I think that only been hinted at before that um, there are rumors that there are ability, a way to give people powers. Um, so now that's kind of been confirmed. There's these cans with vials in them that apparently give people superpowers. Yeah, I think that's what uh, that's what was happening in Gregor the Snail's interlude, basically. Yeah. yeah. So on that, uh, at the end of that, we move into 11.6. And the melee is underway, and it is brutal and horrible, and people are forming coalitions and then betraying each other immediately, and uh, it's just, uh, it's pretty vicious. Yeah, and I like the escalation of it. Um, We talk about escalation a lot uh, in the macro, but we have this little mini fight that escalates very organically, and I like the moment where, like, a guy accidentally, like, kicks a piece of debris into the uh, skid marks field, and it flies into the arena, and then, like, the guy realizes that he can do that, so he just starts throwing stuff, and then everyone jumps on him, and then it just, like, keeps going from there. I really like it. Yeah. So it's obvious to our characters, too, that things are going off the rails. So Lisa calls the retreat. Uh, but as the team starts to leave, Bryce takes that opportunity to bolt. 
he heads for his girlfriend who's who's in the crowd and uh he ends up with the same group of people who attacked sierra's shelter which taylor's able to recognize by sierra's description of them uh, and then bryce and his girlfriend and that whole group i think get sucked into skidmark's arena um for some reason this just caught my attention that, that uh taylor thinks at some point the most i could do would be to use my power on the entire crowd and that would turn this already disturbed situation into something else entirely and my first impulse was yes come on taylor use your power on the crowd i want to see it <laughs> yeah let's uh let's mace bugs an entire crowd full of violent and anxious people i'm sure nothing bad would happen yeah. people who are already fighting and trying to kill each yeah, other this yeah will, yeah it'll work yeah so team strike force decides to hold their ground where they are because they need to get rice so they basically just need to wait for the fight to end for that to happen um and they also want to gather intel anyway, so they figure, okay, we'll hang out uh, and, you know, defend ourselves against these monsters. So even though they're not in the arena, they end up fighting because people are just, you know, their blood is up. They just want to fight. So it, it ends up that everybody has to fight, even even uh, Tattletail and, and Taylor, because they're being attacked from all sides and, and injured. And then, bam, Trigger Vision's got... Uh, <sighs> It's something that Taylor has seen before, but forgotten. Two different creatures existing in multiple parallel spaces at once, folding, unfolding, expanding, mirroring, shifting, alive. Enigmas of organs that are also limbs, the size of small planets, moving in a double helix, shedding tissues or energies, communicating with the energy of a star going nova. Destination. Agreement. Trajectory. Agreement. Yeah, uh, I think for once in my life, I'm kind of at a loss of word, loss f- for words here, Matt. Um, I, <laughs> I find the imagery of this absolutely stunning. Um, I have no idea what it means, and I have no idea how it ties into the predictions that I've already made. Um, but I can see this in my head, and, I, and it's it's so cool. And I want this, I want this to exist on film somewhere because, like. The, the image I have in my head is just beautiful of this. And of course it's confusing and trippy and, and weird, but um, I, I have no idea what to do with it. Yeah. I, I don't want to draw your attention to anything uh, in particular, um, but I, but I was going to ask, is there any information here that strikes you as relevant that was not in uh, the previous trigger vision of which we have what only one reference so yeah, far yeah we had yeah. Uh, miss militia's uh, yeah. memory of her trigger vision which was uh, if i recall kind of starkly different um there was only one thing and it was i don't know if it was like i don't know if the thing that miss militia saw is comparable to these two things um i think the important thing is that whatever it is it's alive um and uh i think the idea of them uh their moving apart from each other but agreeing on a spot to re- eventually join up again um I, I don't i don't know what that means but I, that feels like something that's important um <laughs> that's uh, yeah I, I don't i don't know what else um i i, I no like, it, that's that's cool yeah yeah i feel like things have just opened up again and i don't i don't know exactly how yeah i i, I like i i think i like i like to hear you talk about this and i like I think other people like to hear you talk about it because it's impossible for me to rewind back to where my mentality was at this point in the story. So it's nice to be like, it's nice to hear someone's thoughts when they're in this moment, uh, what their conception of this, this, uh, this is. Mm -hmm. So, so it turns out, um, yeah. So Taylor comes back to her senses and, uh, she and Lisa are both highly disoriented. Lisa seems to be worse off than her. And the team is losing the fight, uh, with the two of them out of commission. Taylor ends up having to close her eyes and entirely relying on her bug senses in order to fight. Uh, and she has to just stab and cut so many dudes in this tussle. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I like this because we've seen her work where she couldn't see and basically use the bugs as her eyes before, but we've never seen her do it in like, I'm still going to be physically moving around, but I'm using the bugs as my eyes. And I think that's really cool. Like she could just wear, she could wear a mask that doesn't have eye holes anymore. Like she doesn't even need her eyes anymore to fight. Um, it's true. I think that's so cool. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I, I love this too. It's, and she doesn't even really have to think too hard about it. She's just like, yeah, I can do this. Nope. Yeah. 
So it turns out that all the merchant capes were also disoriented by the vision. Uh, so that's a thing, apparently, that happens when people trigger. Um, and Skidmark, of course, knows what this means. I guess he's witnessed this before. Yeah, so this is yeah, this is the 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 trigger event, and yeah. um, it's cool that I didn't. It didn't even occur to me until it happened that we hadn't seen one before outside of what happened in Miss Militia, and it's like, of course we didn't because I would remember <laughs> this thing happening, um, and you think they would too, but no, they they seem to forget them almost as soon as they happen. Um, but yeah, it's, so many questions. I have so many questions, but I I, I don't know how to ask any of them. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's 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 cool. Um, okay, so the the new cape who has just triggered has a horrifying power uh, that just carves spheres of flesh out of people, and he can't really control it too well. So there's just people being horrifically dismembered all around. Yeah, it's pretty awful, but it also kind of fits, doesn't it? Like he's in a traumatic situation where he wants to be the last man standing in this fight. Um, so his power allows him to remove other people. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. I, I think I like that. So, yeah, no, that that that's excellent. Or you could argue that he got sucked into this, and he just wants to get everyone out of his way to get out. Um, mm-hmm. Either way, I think it works. Yeah, no, that's true. I, I love that. I didn't think, and I regret now that I didn't think to like interpret that power. But that's that's excellent. Um, oh yeah, just one more note on on the on the powers because Tattletail is actually still struggling um, to kind of come out of the the stupor, even though all the other capes appear to be fine. And she's muttering to herself, "They're like viruses," she said. Her voice was thin, as if she had been talking to herself. And babies and gods, all at the same time. Yeah. So I said parasites last week. Virus, parasite is kind of the same thing. Um, but I think the, the important here is that something is infecting people um, that gives them powers. Um, it's a godlike child thing um, that apparently looks like two bio biological tesseracts. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I, I I I love this. I love that I don't fully understand it yet. I'm completely okay with that, and I I know it's going to be something we learn more about as we go. And I cannot wait. Yeah, this is going to be fun for you to go back and listen to later. I think. <laughs> Um, and and do you make anything of the fact that Tattletail takes much longer to shake it off than the others? Well, I think like my assumption is as Tattletail is forgetting these things, her power is refilling in the memory as it fades. Um, so she's just like, she's remembering and understanding more than anyone else is. So it's going to affect her more and for longer. Okay. That's my guess at least. Makes sense. So, uh, the new cape emerges. Uh, Skidmark names him Scrub and <laughs> invites him <laughs> and invites him to choose who to give one of the vials to. It's a terrible name. <laughs> and this kid came up with Eraser on the spot, which is great. Yeah. And then, like, hopefully he, after the merchants collapse, he can, like, take back his new, much better name <laughs> and get rid of Scrub. It's terrible. I mean, if if you choose to think that Skidmark is actually kind of smart secretly, then I like this. I like my own interpretation is that he's intentionally giving all the capes that work for him crappy names so that they're forever like branded as being merchant capes. Um, and like, it, it's harder for you to leave the merchants when your name is Mush. Poop. Um, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Poop cape. <laughs> <laughs> so, um. I have small kids, guys. Give me a break. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, so, I, I uh, like he, that interpretation. I think that's yeah. fair. But I like making fun of this guy, so. Yes, of course. Um, so, so yeah, he, in line with that, uh, Skidmark says, no, you can only give the vial to one of your friends, basically sowing division between him and his old friends so that he'll have a stronger attachment to his new friends, the merchants. Um, at which point, before the vial can actually change hands, Skidder senses the arrival of Labyrinth and the rest of Fault Line's crew. Uh, before the team can escape, the doors have all turned into smooth surfaces. Breaker 12 in the house. Ooh. Wait, I got that right, right? Breaker? Yes. Uh, sh- what is it? Wait. <laughs> I don't know. Sh- ch- uh, sh- shaker, actually. Damn it. Whatever. <laughs> we'll, we'll edit that out in post, Scott. We, no, we won't. I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna okay. own up to it, just like my fire axe. <laughs> All right, it's my fire axe to bear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
So 11.7, neuter drops down from the ceiling and snags the vial intended for Doug. And uh, then he makes to grab the case full of the other vials. Skidmark uses his cape that he's wearing on his ridiculous costume as a medium to host his power and uh, shoves neuter away with it. And um, while the merchants are dealing with neuter, Taylor searches the bloody fighting area for Bryce as Labyrinth changes the whole shopping mall into a creepy maze complete with giant foreboding statues. God, I love this. I love this so much. And I love that it comes after we fully understand uh, how powerful Labyrinth is, because we saw that little moment with her uh, back when they were still fighting uh, Empire 88, or ABB, sorry. I get the, I get the gang names confused. Yeah, me too. Um, but, then, uh, but then now we have an understanding of how powerful she is, and now we're seeing it kind of in its full potential. And that's like, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's cool because this is another power where we've seen it before, but we haven't quite seen the full ramifications when it's going all out. So there's a lot going on here. Um, uh, Gregor Faultline and, myster- and a mysterious new redhead cape slide down poles created by Labyrinth to join the fight. This battle is pretty involved. Okay, so there's there's a large number of combatants, and the fact is that, that the literal geography of the battlefield is also changing dynamically, like moment to moment, um, in favor of Faultline's crew. So the main idea behind this fight is that Faultline's crew are going for the case and and whatever is in it and battling the merchants while Taylor is trying to retrieve Bryce and not really worrying too much about anything else. Um, But she has to navigate this shifting terrain as well. So we're seeing fragments of this battle as Taylor moves between areas and over walls um, and as these areas close off from each other. Yeah, and that's that's just saying we're not going to go through this beat by beat, but um, I, I do love how cinematic it all is. Um, like you have all these fights happening at the same time. You have Taylor running through the maze. Like each person has a clear objective. Um, everything's kind of naturally segmented off. So like you don't have to artificially divide people. Um, it just really works for me. And like it works for me in kind of all the ways that the battle in the last arc didn't. Um, it, it doesn't feel like forced conflict just for the sake of it. It feels natural and, and everything just plays out the way you think it would. Um, I, I love it. Yeah, me too. Um, so at this point, as they're moving around Charlotte, so Charlotte's probably already figured out that Taylor is a cape um, based on how she responded to the trigger. Um, and I think um, this right here marks the point where Taylor rapidly stops caring about protecting her secret identity because she shows Minor that she can control bugs uh, to direct him as he boosts over a wall. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're right that, that this is now where we see the two separate sides of, of Taylor um, really start to blend as she cares less and less about her Taylor identity. Um, and, and this is probably the most amount of action we've seen her in in her uh, non-cape form in the in the book, I think. Um, yeah. She's kind of always been in these big fights in costume, and she's not here. Um, and so, so as she's jumping over these walls... The walls that she wanted to keep between her personalities are vanishing. I love it. God, I'm good. Christine. Yeah, no, no, that's true. I mean, I think even maybe the act of like being this violent and, you know, this skitter like with, you know, out of costume is making her realize that Taylor is just as capable of these things as skitter is. Yep, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, so Taylor gets uh, Trainwreck's help in knocking down a wall by mentioning that uh, she knows he works for Coil. Yeah, and I don't know if we covered the fact that Trainwreck was here. <laughs> um, yeah. Trainwreck's here, and he appeared to yeah. be working for the merchants, and now we kind of have an idea that Coil is planting people that work for him in different groups. Um, mm-hmm. It kind of is like kind of overwhelming in, in how into everything Coil seems to be, and, and uh, Taylor's eventually going to have to go up against this guy, and it's kind of intimidating. He's got people everywhere. Like we saw it in her dream, like how terrified of that fact she is. And it's kind of true. Um, he's kind of omnipresent. He seems to have things everywhere. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I forgot that that's an element of tension at this point in the story. Um, but yeah, he's he's a terrifying antagonist. You're right. Um, so once they get through that wall, they're led to Bryce, uh, who has been partly carved by Scrub. Uh, his his hand is maimed. His girlfriend and other acquaintances have it much worse off. Uh, most of them are dead. And Thomas, the guy who um, very brutally maimed the guy at the shelter, uh, the really bad dude, he's missing his back, more or less. And Taylor directs Brooks to ignore Thomas and focus on the boy. 
Yeah, and this when this is when she elects to she makes the conscious decision to uh, leave someone to die. And I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about this with you um, because there's there there's this idea about when you're measuring morality and saying is an action moral is inaction in this case moral or immoral and i think those two are weighted differently a lot of times um there's this idea that doing something is worse than not doing something even mm-hmm. if the result is the same um i, I call this the batman begins fallacy <laughs> um because uh in that movie bruce wayne has this code that he's not going to kill anyone at the end of the movie he uh tells Ra's al Ghul, um I'm not going to kill you, but I don't have to save you either. And that's like really just cheating. And it's the same thing. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. What, what, what do you think this says about Taylor? Do you think this was significant or do you, as significant as I feel like it is? I feel like it was significant. This always brings to mind the, the, the trolley problem. Um, you know, the, the classic morality problem where mm-hmm. you, you can choose to throw a switch and save one uh, and save five lives at the cost of one or you can uh or you can not throw the switch and let the trolley kill the five people but at least hey you didn't directly kill someone um this is different because there's no trade-off here it's there's no like she's she's not she's not trading off thomas to save rice both of them probably could have been saved but she feels absolutely no need to do anything for thomas um, and so I do think this is a big like watershed for her because like we've said, she's, she's been increasingly ruthless toward people who she perceives to be bullies. And this is, you know, approaching the maximum of how ruthless you can get by just saying like this, he's, she is saying this person deserves to die and, and that is just, and I am not going to do anything to avert that from happening. Right. Um, and I love the way that it's framed too, is again, we're not going to give you an easy answer here because there are probably going to be some people that make the argument that, that she kind of makes herself. And that I think Brooks makes specifically, um, that if we try to help this guy too, we might get stuck here. We might get slowed down enough to where we get caught up on all this and die like there's there's a lot of extenuating circumstances that could lead you towards saying leaving thomas is okay um and it's for the quote-unquote greater good um but yeah no i agree with you this is a watershed moment and like the only thing at this point we've seen her not do is kill a person directly um after this Um, that's the only thing she has not done yet yeah I think you're right. Um, and, and that, I mean, you're right. This is a big deal. And, and I, I, I think there's, there's a lot of people that would look at this and say that she was okay in doing this and it wasn't as big of a deal. And I, I don't think you're wrong. Um, but just to me, this is a huge deal. Um, and how quickly she kind of makes the decision is a huge deal. Yeah. And, and I think it is, I think it is a big deal to her because she thinks about it later as something that might bother her, but she isn't sure if it's going to bother her. Right. Right. And she seems like, and, and, and when she gets to that later part, she seems like I'll be okay with it. Um, it, yeah. it might bother me later, but I think I can handle it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a great, I mean, I'm, I'm glad we pointed that out. I think that's a big deal. Yeah. So as we leave uh, the area, they see Gregor, um, who is somehow in the real world passing through the obstacles erected by Labyrinth. Um, what does it look like to him? Taylor wonders, and so do I. Yeah, uh, I- I'm starting to get a better idea of her powers, but this all still kind of confused me. Um, so it seems like she has the ability to alter a-, a setting to a certain thing, but she can control which reality people perceive. Um, either they interact with real world or they interact with Labyrinth world. And um, I, I guess the default seems to be that it's Labyrinth World, but um, she can dictate who doesn't. And I, I don't think it's clear how it, that's controlled. Um, I think I remember her touching Taylor at one point, and when she touched her, the perception of the stuff she was building went away. So maybe it's that. I don't know. It, it's really intriguing, and I love this power, and the implications of it is so cool. Yeah, I forgot that happened, but you're right. Yeah, okay. And that, that all makes sense to me. It's, it is really fun power to think about. Um, so we see what Mush's power is, and he's, uh, I think it's a he, I forget actually, making up a giant extended it. body um, 
out of whatever crap is lying around. This is pretty cool too, actually. I like this. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I feel bad. Like he's useless in this fight. So I kind of make fun of him more than I want to, but I can't help but laugh. Have you ever watched uh, Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, Matt? I have not. You should. It's really hilarious. But there's a character in it called Moist, and his superpower is just to make things, like, damp. <laughs> and for whatever reason, when I think about Mush, that's what I'm reminded of. This power that, like, I'm sure it's more effective. I'm sure we have a possibility of seeing him later in his prime, and, like, he's doing really cool stuff. But in this moment, I thought of Moist, and I laughed. Excellent. I'll have to watch this piece of uh, video literature that you're describing. Yeah, that's good. So the the um the redhead woman um do we Scott? So do you know? Do, do you have any ideas about what her power is? Um, we're not really told. And do you no. have any ideas about where she came from? I, I have no idea. I mean, we learn a little bit later, but at this point, I, I, she seems to do like tricky acrobatics and dodgy stuff, and she has a gun. Um, so maybe it's some sort of like enhanced reflexes thingy. Um. I will say, related to her, that if I have one complaint about this battle, it's that we don't know her name. So, like, every time we have to reference her in the fight, she's the redheaded woman, or the new member of Fault Lines crew, or the redheaded woman from Fault Lines crew. And, like, there's a lot of high-paced action going on here, and it feels like having to use that clunky name delivery every single time, like, uh, messes with the pace of this action just a little bit. And I recognize this is like a super minor complaint and it doesn't really matter, but it did catch my eye. Yeah, that, that's that's interesting. That's always the kind of thing that I'm that I'm looking out for when it comes to writing, because action scenes are, are hard. And I, uh, yeah, I, I find that's a problem for me is like if I'm ever writing an action scene, I'm, I'm like, how do how many different ways can you say like the guy who I haven't actually given a name to yet? Yeah, um, yeah. I, and I, I think it's it, it's compounded here a bit because so many of the merchant capes we don't have names for either. So we have just a lot of general descriptive phrases being used for characters um, in action. And I think that's probably why it just adds up a little bit for me. Okay. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I found it distracting. You know, it's always helpful to um it's always helpful to have the audio the, the worm audio book. Um, yeah, yeah. Because then they're pacing it for me and I don't have to deal with, with uh, my own eyes tripping me up, which is, a, I think, a problem with me. Yeah, so the uh, the merchant capes at this point have now been thoroughly trounced and embarrassed. Uh, we see that theme of reputation here uh, by Fault Lines crew. But Skidmark tries to get in one last dig by blasting the case with the vials into the air and causing its contents to be scattered everywhere. Taylor retrieves some of the drifting papers with her bugs, ending up with four or five pages. And the team gets outside because Tattletail sees the edge of Labyrinth's power and they and they make their way through that crack. God, they're so good at running away from things. <laughs> A lot of running centric powers. <laughs> so now we are looking at these pages and it's time for some delicious world building. We get some text from the documents and then Neuter drops in and adds some more information. And I'm not really going to go into detail or even really summarize this. Instead, I'm going to ask what you make of it. Yeah, um, so there's a lot to parse here. And um, I think first things first, I think we have a new big bad um, in Cauldron. Um, I don't think I'm too out of line in making the assumption that Cauldron is not good um, because they're testing formulas on people and either killing them, enslaving them, or dumping them on the streets uh, while erasing their memory. Um, so hopefully I don't get a lot of angry people like I did with Dragon. <laughs> um, but but so I'm not sure if it's a person or a group. It kind of seems like it's a group because in a contract they list Cauldron. Um, so I, I would assume that's the name of a group or a company or something. Um, but we know that they sell powers to people for a ridiculous amount of money. So we know that they're super well funded. Um, we know that they're pretty amoral. They don't seem to care about uh, the implications of stuff they're doing. Um, they know they require their clients to also run errands for them. So they give someone superpowers, but in their contract say, um, you have to help us do something. So that leads me to believe they could be this like a global organization that has like 
managed to infiltrate a lot of different places. Because if you give a person powers, he he becomes a member of the protectorate or something. Um, and then you just activate that clause in his contract that says, you have to help me with something now. Um, and if you don't, I'll send my assassin after you, um, which seems pretty effective um, as a way of controlling them. So uh, I think I think we we get a lot of stuff that, and I'm making some in, yeah, some uh, speculations and guesses here, but it seems like this group is very powerful and possibly more powerful than anything we've encountered so far. Um, organization wise, the, the Endbringers are pretty freaking strong, but um, that's that's just my general thoughts on it. Yeah, yeah, that, that all makes sense. Um, yeah, I think I know you, you can't. Really, I know you can't really. We can't really have a dialogue here because <laughs> you know things that I don't. But um, yeah, I mean, that's frankly my ul- ulterior motive in making you summarize it instead <laughs> of me doing it was that I was like, yeah, it's going to be really hard for me to summarize this without pointing you in directions. But, yeah, uh, I think the, the the key things to me is that um, I, I I'm not clear at all about what their end game is. Like, why are they giving people powers? Why are they recruiting an army more or less what this project nemesis is why they're dropping monsters on the street and erasing their memories um but it does strike me as very different from coil who just seems to kind of want power for power's sake um this feels like something else and i'm really excited to see what it is okay interesting uh, just a little beat in here i like how taylor is offended at the idea that people can buy powers because she earned hers um with her trauma obviously yeah i do like that too um and and i I think there'll be a lot of capes that echo that sentiment um because they've suffered for their powers and here are these people that just uh are rich right uh yeah and then then of course i mean i think you i think you pointed this out but when neuter shows up it's obvious that that neuter already knows a lot about this and being in case 53 he he knows kind of that he was a test subject for these people um so yeah yeah, and this I think this ties into the Gregor chapter, right, where they were trying to figure out uh, kind of where where they came from. So I think Neuter might have a little bit more information than he had when we saw through Gregor's head, but uh, not too much more. So there's still a lot of stuff that they don't know either. So hopefully we get to learn as he does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so at this point, uh, having already blown her identity to several other people, Taylor goes ahead and blows her identity to Neuter uh, when she gives him the papers. Um, and shows off her bug powers yeah she's she's really at this point really indifferent to taylor as a separate entity now right i mean like this is a bad guy now that she's showing this off to so um but again i think this makes sense because she has been just living as skitter full time now like she's not attending school she's not living her life as taylor anymore um so it kind of does make sense for these walls to come down now yeah, but she is burning bridges. Well, that's true. Without, she's not thinking about it, I think, is what I want to draw attention to. She's not yeah. like, this is going to make it hard for me if if I ever want to like be Taylor a bit more. That's true. Because yeah. now there's literally, I, I, she's pretty much all these mercenaries, um, probably Charlotte. I mean, we find out eventually, yes, indeed, Charlotte. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to see more before the end of the chapter. It, it's quite a tally. Um, and she's not really feeling, she's not really feeling any loss about it. She's just like, oh, well, whatever. So. Yeah. Because I think that the two personalities have molded into one person. She is both Taylor and Skitter, um, simultaneously now. Yeah. Um, I, I just like the moment where she looks at Charlotte, uh, having revealed her power and she shrank back as if I could hurt her by looking at her. Which was dumb. It was fairly obvious to anyone who considered my power that I didn't need to look at them to hurt them. <laughs> I, I like this too, but to be fair, to be fair, she then says, not that I do that. <laughs> so, I mean, it was an afterthought, but she still thought it. So that's fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Kind of like when, when Arms Master was just rhetorically asking if, if uh, Rachel's disposable dogs were on site. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, 11-8, the team, with their rescued civilians, heads into the office of good old Dr. Q. Taylor sits across from Charlotte and starts interacting with her. And, Scott, I think we may legitimately disagree about what exactly Taylor is doing here. I I see her approach as being very aggressive, almost, dare I say, bullying. (laughs) with casual justifications to herself thrown in as she goes 
Uh, although I vacillate on this opinion each time I read this section, um, I think you see her approach as more reasonable and warranted, perhaps. Yeah, I, I kind of do. I, I think that I think it's fair that Taylor might be coming off as bullying and aggressive, but I don't think she's trying to do that. I think she's trying to approach this from a rational perspective. And I think it, it, it's contrasting with any time she's had to deal with people uh, as a cape before, as skitter, it's always been with fear and violence. Always. Um, and I think that the fact that she doesn't go with that here explicitly um, is telling. I think it says something about it. I think it shows growth. She tries to explain this to Charlotte rationally. She tries to to talk with her as a human being and say, look, here's the issue. Like, here's the choices. Um, this is what I got for you. And yeah, I, I think you're right that the, the threat of violence lingers there. It's not non-existent. Um, but I, I do really appreciate that in this moment, she chooses to go not with fear, um, but with, with, uh, a conversation trying to talk to someone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, that's true. I guess I don't find that too, um, reassuring because like the, the actual factual things she's conveying is she's saying either leave town or work for me. And, and like you said, there's, there's that threat of violence there. And she is very, um, she justifies herself, you know, to herself and also, you know, obviously to the reader because we're in her head. Um, and I think I probably found this perfectly convincing the first time that I read the story because I would, you know, I think most people who read it are on team Taylor the first time they read it. Not that I'm not on team Taylor, but I'm, I'm definitely becoming a lot more aware of where she is just being self-justifying and not for a moment is she like well maybe i don't need to like basically ruin this person's life because they saw my secret identity like <laughs> like like maybe she has maybe i can just overlook this like there's not even a flicker of that it, it's just like nope she saw my face um you know she doesn't do this to any of any of the other people who saw her identity she doesn't freak out about neuter seeing it she's just i mean okay fair enough that uh charlotte knows that her name is taylor hebert you know mm -hmm. um so that's that, that makes it that makes it significantly different um i just feel like she's she's taylor she's very taylor about this she's made up her mind about how this is going to go she's locked in on it she's very reasonable and, and patient and inexorable about it and uh they it just, uh, I mean, I mean, I think maybe just to summarize from Charlotte's point of view, I, th if I were in Charlotte's place, I would feel completely trapped and bullied into making the choice that she ends up making now. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe you disagree yeah. with that. I, 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 I don't directly disagree. I, I think, I think she's in a, she's in a, a kind of a, just a generally shitty situation. Um, and, and I don't, I think the fact that she does know her name is means something. And it, it is, it is a situation that is a lot more problematic than any of the other ones that she dealt with. She never, like she never reveals herself to Charlotte specifically. Charlotte's just there as she reveals herself to other people. So, I mean, it is a problem that she has to do something with. And I agree that maybe she should have at least considered for a moment the option three of uh, just hoping that you can take this person by their word. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I just and I, I think we, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but I think what the fact that the thing that finally convinces Charlotte to agree to work for her is not. Um, the fear aspect, not the bullying aspect, but that she observes the conversation between Sierra and them. And I interpreted that as, as positively too, that it, it, it grounds her and makes her kind of, uh, believe what Taylor's saying more. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but, um, I, I don't know. I, I think, I, I don't, I don't think you're, you're like wrong. I just, I, I read this as much less threatening. Yeah, I think as hard as we're trying to have an argument here, uh, I, I can, <laughs> Matt, you're I can wrong and stupid. Yeah, right. You're uh, you're reading wrong, Scott. And, uh, <laughs> Read better. Yeah, I don't think we can continue this project together if you're going to have this position, Scott. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! Yeah, yeah. No. So, so yeah. I mean, I think 
I think these are two valid lenses to, to viewing this um yeah this scene. Yeah, so I, I think I think we're kind of at an impasse here. I think we both kind of understand each each person's opinion, but um, we're not going to like change anyone's mind. Um, and I, I don't think I'm not going to say we're e- either of us is wrong. Um, especially not me. I'm definitely not wrong. But uh, <laughs> the one thing I did want to point out before we move on from this is just that this is the moment where we see the end of our three beat where um, uh, Charlotte calls Taylor a villain and she replies, I am a villain. I agreed. And that's the end of that arc throughout the arc of she has fully embraced her villain hood. Um, and I, 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 I liked, I liked catching that and observing it. And I think the more you pay attention, the more you can see three beats in everything. Cause it's everywhere. Um, and I thought it was really cool here. Yeah, no, that, I, I agree. I didn't recognize it as a three beat, but it, it, it is, and it s- serves as one very functionally. So, yep. so yeah. Um, so yeah, Sierra shows up, uh, and Tattletail tries to communicate to her that Bryce had actually been with the merchants. Sierra angri- angrily rejects this until Skitter once again blows her identity to one more person. <laughs> um, and, and says, yeah, she's right. Um, I've lost track of how many people this is. Um, yeah. So Taylor, um, Taylor takes the tack that Brian, uh, sorry, that Bryce's loss, um, of most of his hand is probably punishment enough for his bad call. Matt, do you hear it was a bad call Ripley in your head every time you read the words bad call? Of course I do, Scott. Okay. Just making sure. Yeah. I think everyone does. I actually looked uh, to see if I could find that on the internet and it (laughs) doesn't exist. Wow. I would have played it right now, but I can't. That's hard to believe. I know. Um, so Taylor sort of admits and or takes credit for killing a bunch of people who attacked the shelter, uh, uh, which is not actually true, although she did let Thomas die. Um, yeah, and I think that's I think it's that's partially what this is. I think it's partially is her admitting that she let Thomas die, um, but it's it's also partially just posturing for Sierra um, right, to right. make herself look strong. Yeah, yeah. I thought this was interesting anyway that she she's willing to let Sierra have this impression of her. Yeah. So ultimately, Lisa suggests that employing Bryce would give him what he wants and and basically satisfy the needs that he was expressing when he joined the merchants and also keep him safe and somewhat out of trouble. So, yeah, like like he pointed out, having seen all this negotiating, this is the point where Charlotte decides that she'll work for Taylor. Yeah. And I think I think this does kind of reinforce my interpretation Um, but maybe you could read this with a different interpretation as well. So maybe that would reinforce yours if you read it with yours. I don't know, but I just feel like her, the reason she decided was because she sees that Taylor, uh, while her methods are a little suspect that she does generally want to help people out and she sees her rationality and she, and it it does ground her. Um, uh, so I, I think, I think it feels like, a way to demonstrate growth in Taylor. Like at the end of last chapter, we see she specifically says she's really bad at the social interaction stuff, but in this chapter, she kind of nails it. Yeah. Um, I think she's very convincing and she's very rational. And, and I, I, my interpretation just enforces that more. So I like it better. Yeah. So no, I, well, I do think even notwithstanding, you know, um, I still feel like Taylor was being a bit too aggressive earlier. I think, at this point, it is the case that Charlotte is being like, oh, OK, like this isn't going to be so, so bad. So it's a lot easier for her to take that choice. I, I think that's mm-hmm. true. Um, yeah. So um, Taylor and Charlotte return to Skitter's lair where Gru is keeping an eye on things. Uh, am I right in interpreting that Imp and Gru share a territory? Uh, because that actually does seem like a good combo against mundanes. Yeah, I think that's I think that that is true. Yeah, it's basically two people who are really good at hiding or disappearing. Um, yeah. So it turns out that Tattletail called Brian and talked to him about what Taylor had said, despite um, Taylor telling her not to. Uh, see, Scott, we talked about how great this is earlier, having side characters actually take initiative and do things off screen. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um this is something I really like about the story, and I think we'll get into this more in, in a later arc, but um, I do love how side characters 
are active and have roles and and do things off screen that make them seem like they're real human beings. Yeah, yeah, that's. I, I mean, I mean, it's it's indispensable, really, and it's it's done very well here. So yeah. Anyway, Brian uh, apologizes for his recent hard headedness, and he shows some vulnerability by asking if they can be friends again, and he leaves. Taylor with some generally good feelings in the air and uh, Charlotte has uh, cleaned herself up and now she's making food. And Taylor thinks all in all, if I didn't think too hard about it, I can feel cautiously optimistic for the first time in a long while. For the first time in weeks, months, I could feel like everything just might work out. So this is the uh, most foreboding ending to an arc yet. (laughs) Yep. Um, It's so transparently foreboding too. I love it. Um, Like, she's in this place where she's finally feeling confident and, and you know, she's made questionable decisions. We've talked over and over again about how she's uh, traveling down this, this villain path that's concerned us, but um, it, she's, things are really good for her right now. She's got her friend back. She's got minions. Now she's got her own place. She has pretty solid control of her, her, uh, her territory. So uh, now, it, now in narrative language, that means it's time to royally fuck everything up. <laughs> So yes, next week the <laughs> second half of this arc. Which um, do you, do you or are there any clues in like the uh, chapter names that that you can talk about, or, or is that not a thing? No, I, I okay. don't. I don't. I, I don't okay. think so. Yeah, I think you're right. I was just. I haven't. Yeah. I like. I, no, I don't want to speculate. I okay. have no idea. Yeah, that's fine. Well, I know you don't want to speculate, <laughs> but it is time for Scott's speculations. Okay. Um. That's a perfect transition. Um, Mm. Before we go into the new stuff, I just want to really quickly go over some of the old ones um, that we got information on. Um, My Taylor body mind increases as her as her power increases her power um, as she as a near death defense mechanism. I don't know why I had so much trouble saying that sentence, (laughs) Um, but uh, I'm going to call that wrong right now. We know why, and it's close, but not quite. Um, And then. My my prediction on Weld's ability to cheat the Manton effect uh, is the result of testing and experimentation. Um, I I don't think we can call this true for sure, but we did learn that he's a a, a fifty three thing. I forgot what it's called. A case fifty three. Yeah, there we yeah. go. Yeah. Um, so and we know that those were specifically tested on and and kind of designed. So kind of maybe. Um, I think there's more information we need here, but uh, I think we got a little bit towards me being kind of right i don't know yeah i mean i i would um i guess i would say it would be nice to have more information to, to really <laughs> call it but this is a um, very political response well i mean it certainly is the directional information that you are uh, mm-hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as new ones uh we've already talked about two of them um in that uh the glasses people were moving their glasses has to do with shatter beaks shattering um and that lisa's triggering event had to do with her sister um, who reminds her of taylor that uh, either died or got hurt in some reason that had to do with with lisa not knowing things that she needed to know or, or didn't notice or feels guilty about noticing um so those are the two new ones i have a new one i'm gonna spring on you right now matt all right, I'm um, excited. I didn't, even, I didn't even write this in the notes. Oh my god! Um, because as we were talking, I was thinking about uh, the idea of a second triggering event. We've heard of this occurring before, um, but we haven't seen it. But we've heard rumors of it. I'm guessing that this will trigger. You know, we see powers increase as uh, people get more closer to the emotional state they were in when their first trigger event happened. Um, so the, I think the second trigger event will happen will be just the extreme version of that, where they're very much in that same emotional state. So I'm going to guess that Brian, our boy Gru, has a second trigger event, and it is related in somehow to uh, Imp, uh, who is now on his team and he's with regularly, um, either getting hurt or being under threat. And so he triggers in much the same way as he did the first time, um, trying to protect her. So that's interesting. That's that's my my out of left field speculation for you. I th- thought that would be fun. Yeah. So 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 I I mean I, I'm just gonna say I definitely as soon as I started talking about second trigger events in the story, my first thought was, well, we're gonna see one of those. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, you and, don't bring up something like that in a narrative unless you're yeah. gonna do something with it. 
yeah and, and I, I think it's it's very interesting that um that, that yeah that that aisha um is is proximal to Gru, and that actually does seem to to, to create a plausible yeah. little, little link there that's yeah that's very interesting yeah so i mean i i think the, the easy solution is that it's going to happen to taylor because she's your your protagonist but that's why i kind of didn't want to go that way because wild Bo seems to be skirting some of those traditional narrative things so um not saying it could not happen to taylor as well but um that's 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 a prediction for a different day all right uh, this is this is yet again extremely delightful segment of our show <laughs> I love trying to parse your reactions to it and seeing if I can read in any information based on how you react. I love it. I hope that you are not successful. <laughs> I'm not. Okay. All right, Scott. Well, that will wrap up the first half of ARC 11, Infestation. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. As always, we appreciate your feedback, and we're always trying to improve. So let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. Yeah, you can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod. Uh, friendly reminder that I am live tweeting each time I read uh, the new arc for the week on Twitter. So if you want to follow along with me, uh, you can follow that Twitter there. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I enjoy it more every week I do it. Um, also, my personal Twitter is at scottdaily85. That's D-A-L-Y. And Matt's is at mordinamail. And I am not going to spell it. Um, but you can follow us and see, uh, we talk about other stuff. Matt had a memento tweet that made me laugh. Excellent. But I responded yes. to it and you didn't press the, the heart. And oh, made me sad. hold on. Give me a minute. <laughs> Let's pause the tape. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, go, go like my memento tweet, everyone. And then, uh, and then follow us. So if you haven't uh, already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Overcast, and pretty much anywhere else in the world that you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, and all of our writing, essays, film, and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. We also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms. As of this recording, we are a mere $4 away from hitting our next goal, which will allow us to start hosting a quarterly worm fan art contest. This is something Scott and I uh, were talking about doing as early as our second week of the podcast, and we're absolutely thrilled that we're almost able to actually do it this quickly. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're frankly shocked. Uh, so check out the Patreon page for more de details and donate to help make this happen. Special thanks to our new associate producer donor, Jackson K, and our new producer donor, Raj. I don't. I don't know. Thank Braj. you, person. Sorry. I can't. I can't pronounce. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, it tears me up that I can't pronounce your name, but uh, you guys are are awesome, and uh, this is so motivating for us. Uh, also, while you're over at Patreon, make sure you stop by Wildbo's page and toss some money there because he's the guy that makes this whole thing possible. Yeah, and if you are one of those people that cannot spare some extra cash, we do completely understand. There are uh, tons of ways to still help us out. You can share the podcast with your friends. Um, that like Worm with your friends that haven't even read Worm and convince them to, because why would you not read this book? I don't, I don't know why you would do that. That's weird. Um, if you're listening via iTunes, you could also take just a quick minute to rate and review our podcast. Um, we keep getting new reviews every week. You guys are doing great with that. And in fact, Matt, I'm going to read one right now. Um, Please do. Because that will encourage people um, to to do it and show that we really appreciate the time you take. So this one um, just came in today uh, from Night of Mirrors. Um, it's titled Enjoyable Accompaniment to Reread. Um, and he says, great addition to the experience of rereading the series. They offer insightful commentary and very thorough narrative analysis. Really helps to appreciate all the aspects of Wild Bow's work. Definitely recommend for any first or second time readers to listen to after reading each arc. Uh, Night of Mirrors, thank you so much. That is so nice. Um, and there are a bunch of other ones on there that I'm not going to read right now because we're already way over on time as usual. But, um, but thank you guys so much for taking the time to do that. We really do appreciate it. And I will make sure to read a new one each week. Yeah, some of these are extremely nice and motivating. Yeah, I can't believe it. Yeah, you guys, you guys like... There's 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 honestly some days where this takes so long to 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 set up that we're we're kind of tired and and it's you guys encouragement and uh, excitement that keeps us going. That's right. 
So next week, we're going to wrap up Arc 11 with the interlude chapters. And uh, things are looking great for Taylor at the moment. And I'm sure these eight chapters will be filled with sunshine, rainbows, and nothing but happiness. That's right. Until then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.